Are we? I think we are live. Uh, hello, and welcome to live programming here at the Moore Freedom Foundation. Uh, if you're new here, the way this works is I typically bloviate on some topic for a half hour to an hour or so, and then we have the live chat that's going on throughout, and I'll take questions probably for half hour to an hour after that. Um, so uh, please participate in the live chat. Um, be civil to each other. You are invited to be as uh, negative and insulting towards me as you like. Uh, we accept a very broad uh, range of opinions uh, in the uh, chat, uh, but we don't accept uh, being abusive to others or being abusive to sort of the flow of the chat. Um, so today, uh, I'm actually uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about me. Uh, which appeals to, uh, I think, somebody who's as self-obsessed as I am. Um, lately, I've been challenged a bit uh, for my credentials, you know, sort of, you know, who are you to be saying all these things, um, which I think is a very rational question to be asking. Um, so first, uh, first I'm going to go through my educational qualifications, then I'm going to uh, go through my professional stuff, uh, and then I'll probably uh, just sort of talk and, you know, somewhat unstructured terms about my experience and why I decided to do this YouTube channel and maybe even how it's developed until I notice the uh, viewership numbers falling significantly and then we'll switch to Q&A. Uh, so uh, this one's a little self-indulgent, but I think it's actually useful uh, to do because I do get that question now and again, you know, you know, who are you? Why would you be talking about this sort of stuff? So I think it makes sense to, to get into it. Um, so first off, uh, my name is Rob. Um, I am uh, the More Freedom Foundation. I am, uh, well, and I, I don't think I would say that I am all there is the More Freedom Foundation because none of this would be possible without you guys. Uh, uh, I mean, without the viewers, without certainly without the patrons, uh, and without like any number of people, including folks who don't really, you know, some people who don't even really like the videos much, <laughs> uh, you know, friends and family who've let me stay on their couches and uh, stuff like that. The More Freedom Foundation, uh, I'm the only employee, I suppose. That's a good way to put it. Um, but uh, I, I feel like I work for uh, all of you folks out there. Um, and uh, you've been very generous, which has allowed this to keep going uh, for its, its uh, four and a half years I've been doing this full time. Uh, so yeah, my name is Rob. Uh, I'm from the United States. Um, I have two degrees. Um, I graduated in 2002 from the University of Michigan uh, with, uh, gosh, you know, a bachelor's, a Bachelor of Arts, I believe it was. I had two majors in the uh, degree. It was history and political science. So that actually kind of uh, dovetails rather nicely uh, with what I do here. Um, in 2008, I started um, law school at uh, the George Washington University. Graduated in 2011, and I am a member of the New York Bar. Uh, the way people, the way we do legal education in the United States is a little bit different um, from most of the world. Uh, we have a separate law school that last year. After working for six years, I went back to law school. So I did that for three years, and it was uh, certainly a lot of fun. Um, so that's, I mean, that is my educational background. Uh, I am still technically an attorney. I haven't done any real legal work in about three years at this point. Um, but I'm a member of the New York Bar, and I just gave them a chunk of money to uh, to illustrate that. Um, so yeah, I guess those are my educational qualifications, if folks are noticing, um, if folks are, are interested. Uh, it's funny, I was as I was thinking in the run up to this, I'm traditionally actually kind of dismissive of my actual sort of official educational experience, not because those institutions weren't amazing uh, or you know filled with great professors and great people doing great work. They absolutely were. Um, I just have never been a very good student. I've always been more of a, um, I guess as autodidact, is that the appropriate, uh, the appropriate word? I've always been more someone who uh, learns for himself, uh, I think. My reading is probably more important than any of the official education that I've gotten. That's always sort of been my standard line, um, you know, sort of an undergrad, you know, I sort of majored in partying with a sort of minor in rowing. Um, uh, I was a student athlete. Uh, that used to be sort of my standard line, but it's, it's it actually, especially in the past year or so, 
more and more stuff that I've gotten into on the channel has actually been directly from undergraduate classes from 20 years ago or law school classes from uh, uh, 10 years ago. Wow. Um, and actually, in some ways, my law school experience was what got me to launch this channel in the first place, which I'll get into a bit later. Um, so actually, I think I think I should probably be less dismissive of my experience in formal education. I think uh, I definitely didn't get as much out of it as I should have. But uh, you know, there's, there's there's stuff still rocketing around uh, around my brain that uh, was actually quite useful. Um, specifically, there was a um, one of the better performing videos in recent months was Donald Trump. Uh, why did Donald Trump really bomb Syria? And uh, the sort of, you know, the message that I put forward was it actually wasn't really about anything happening in Syria or U.S. policy. It was really just a question of agenda setting and um, the way that sort of um, the interests of Washington, D.C. Um, uh, factions interact with the news media and interact with what Trump says. So it was about agenda setting, which is a concept that I learned in political science courses back at the University of Michigan in like 2000 um, and was just rocketing around my head somewhere. So yes, uh, those are my qualifications. They are useful to what I do, but I definitely think what is more useful has been sort of my professional experience. So, so we'll move then to sort of the next, next phase of that. Um, I, uh, well, I'm from, I mean, this is, this is important, getting a little too biographical, but I'll be quick about it. I'm from the New York City suburbs. I was actually born in Manhattan and lived in New York City until the age, but that was New York City in the 80s. Um, so uh, I think my family might have actually been part of, uh, I don't know if you'd technically call it white flight, if it was just sort of outright... Uh, outright fear of crime in the 80s, which was pretty nat and pretty rational. Uh, but for whatever reason, uh, my family moved out of uh, New York City when I was nine years old, and we moved to the New York City suburbs. And I grew up in a fairly comfortable New York City suburb. Um, the general attitude was that Rudy Giuliani, the crusad crusading mayor of New York City, was a great guy. Um, and that was sort of the context that I came from. Uh, my family is very Republican, um, so uh, I think those who watch this channel know that uh, I am not. Um, but I still sort of define myself as a, as a conservative, and uh, I think that has something to do with my, my upbringing. Um, so went to um, public high school. Um, well, it's a public high school in... Uh, uh, in the United States is a pretty nice educational experience. Um, so went to school, went to the University of Michigan. Uh, when I got out, um, actually, I think we're talking about my time at the University of Michigan. In high school, I didn't really think about politics too much. Uh, I mean, the, the main issue back then was, yeah, it was actually, I think it was my freshman year in high school, was the O.J. Simpson trial. Um, I mean, it just politics, it was, it was the 90s in the United States. Uh, politics just wasn't really an issue. Uh, I mean, at that point, I think mean, while I was in high school, um, it's funny. Yeah, well, yeah, there was the Monica Lewinsky scandal. That, that was a big deal. Um, but really, it just the extent to which it was more, we could look at the Lewinsky scandal and look at the O.J. Simpson scandal as sort of on the same plane and as about, you know, similarly important. Uh, to our lives and sort of how we experience things, uh, which is which is kind of crazy um, looking back on it. But yeah, I guess in high school I was sort of like reflexively left wing or whatever. I mean, whatever. I was like 17 or 18. Uh, first political experiences in my life was going to the University of Michigan uh, campus. And uh, my experience at University of Michigan was not uh, a, a, a um, an extremely... Uh, uh, studious one, um, and I feel like uh, my sense of that campus is that it was filled with a whole bunch of people who did not care about politics and were just there to get a degree or sort of make their way through, yet they had to constantly deal with this sort of absurd left-wing um, administration, and uh, so that was actually what sort of was my first sort of formative political experience was sort of dealing with campus liberals and just being not very impressed. Um, I think some people, some of my friends would say that I'm just uh, 
contrarian dick. Um, and, you know, I'm just sort of making up, you know, I'm just claiming to be conservative to piss people off, which might, might, might there might be a little bit of truth to that. But also, I, I do think that, uh, you know, if I read, you know, Edmund Burke, and I generally somebody who thinks that the United States has gotten a number of things right, um, and we should continue uh, to doing, uh, continue to, to do those things right, and we should fix the things that are wrong. Um, and, uh, but not sort of throw, throw the baby out with the bathwater. So that, you know, I am conservative. I do think that, uh, um, the United, as I said, uh, there are a number of things that the United States has gotten right, and those things should be preserved. Um, but we should constantly be changing. We should constantly be tuning the dials, uh, making things better. So I guess I'm a bit of an incrementalist, but, um, uh, I think actually, especially as, uh, um, the U.S.'s politics go more and more left, which I think is kind of inevitable at this point. You've got both Trump and the Sanders wing of the Democratic Party pushing in that direction. I'm probably going to start looking a lot more conservative. But, uh, um, but anyway, so that happened at school. Um, so the one thing, um, and I think as, as many twice of the whole kit and caboodle, you know, the whole the whole thing. It's like, well, okay, if I'm lean conservative and I, because of certain campus politics issues, um, then I read this magazine that has this whole other range of things that you're supposed to believe in. So I more or less sort of went with that and, you know, didn't really think too critically about a lot of those things that I was expected to now believe in. Um, and, uh, you know, some, I, I mean, I was always anti-drug war. Um, I don't think I was ever, uh, I don't think I was ever anti-abortion. Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I was a conservative. I never voted for the Republicans, um, but, uh, you know, I was right-leaning for sure. Um, uh, but the one thing that sort of stuck in my head was I, uh, I didn't believe that equality of opportunity was being was being provided in the United States. My thinking was, okay, all this is right. This is the one sort of, um, the one vulnerability to this philosophy that I've decided to buy into is the fact that, you know, education isn't equal and people aren't given the opportunity um, in the United States to sort of start off. So that's uh, why I sort of initially out of college, geared myself a little more towards um, uh, education. I was never brave enough to be a teacher, but uh, I worked in education policy in sort of, uh, not education policy actually, it was actually I worked for an organization that provided services in and around the Washington DC public schools uh, in, uh, in sort of inner city Washington DC. Um, and that was a tremendously uh, educational experience, uh, both, um, in terms of uh, sort of how politics works um, and how that can impact services. Uh, it was really interesting. The Wire became uh, very famous um, a number of years back. The Wire, it's an HBO television show. Issues of uh, inner city politics. Uh, it's interesting, there's five seasons and each season sort of focuses on a different thing. And I really felt like, I mean, obviously there was nothing about it was that dramatic or whatnot, but I really got to have that experience in Washington, D.C. Um, Baltimore, of course, is a much, much worse off city than Washington, D.C., but Washington, D.C. Was a, is a profoundly odd place. Uh, it's uh, uh, the most, I believe, it's the most educated um, uh, jurisdiction in the United States, it's something like... 50 to 60 percent of people have an undergraduate degree um you know 30 percent of a grad degree those figures are not correct yet at the same time it's also uh, a place with really deep-rooted poverty so i worked for i didn't work for the dc public schools but i worked with an organization that interacted very heavily with uh, the dc public schools and it was this place that was uh you know the dc education was simultaneously the most expensive uh, public education system in the United States, and, and it was it was sort of interesting being a part of that. Um, 
So actually that experience on balance would have probably confirmed me in more uh, hardcore conservative views. And I, to this day, have a real animus towards public sector unions that um, uh, that may be unfair, um, but but it is real and, and brought from uh, a lived experience. Um, however, um, what was happening in national politics during that period of time uh, when I was a 20 something uh, did not uh, end up pushing me towards uh, conservatism. 9-11 uh, happened my junior year in college. Um, uh, no, sorry, my senior year uh, of university. 9-11 happened um, and politics in the United States took a turn. For the initial years, um, I was all on board. You know, I had these sort of right wing views and uh, it was sort of, you know, you know, the official appropriate answer uh, was given to me. Uh, so I was actually a big, big uh, rock sorter. tons of emails. Uh, I was sort of, uh, you know, I didn't have a platform like this uh, in 2003. YouTube didn't exist, but I'm sure uh, some of the patrons of this channel, um, uh, uh, some of my college buddies uh, have endless emails of me just sort of regurgitating. Um, uh, was Fox News as big back then? It's sort of regurgitating National Review and Fox News talking points about how we had to go to war in Iraq. I think at root, I was not someone who ever bought the WMD thing. My justification for going to war in Iraq was I was angry. Um, we had been wronged and uh, we had to go get this guy. Um, obviously, uh, between 2003, 2006, um, that went very, very poorly. Um, and, uh, sort of every day in the news, I'd sort of get a sense of just how inadequate we were to the task we had set ourselves. And I began to have sort of questions about that task. Um, so I went from sort of, I never actually voted for a Republican, but I think certainly um, in the um, early 2000s, I argued on behalf of them and was happy when Bush was still just barely happy uh, when Bush won uh, re-election in 2004. So, um, but uh, as Iraq turned into more and more of a disaster, um, uh, I turned very, uh, very firmly against sort of uh, the, the mainline Republican Party um, and began to describe myself as a libertarian. I never was completely comfortable with that label, um, but I think it did a better job of describing who I was than, um, uh, than anything else. The uh, Libertarian Party was the only one that really focused on issues that were very important to me, sort of inner city injustice, specifically you know, drug war, um, that sort of thing. And also, uh, they're the only major party that, well, I guess the Green Party, but they're hard to take seriously. This was Libertarian Party. I spoke about how insane US foreign policy was. And I really identify with that. I still identify with that. And uh, if Donald Trump weren't on the ticket, um, I'd probably still be voting Libertarian, even though I don't describe myself as a Libertarian anymore. Um, so yeah, that was sort of my evolution um, in uh, in my twenties. Um, I got very jaded uh, working around in and around not for but around the DC public schools, um, and um, sort of went to law school out of inertia. Um, I had uh, sort of always meant to retake the LSAT, so I retook the LSATs and I did okay. So I said, what the heck, why don't I apply to some places? And no, oh, I got into a pretty good place. And and um, so I quit my job and was like, I'm going to take the summer to really figure something out, something else to do better than law school. And uh, by the end of the summer, I'd, I, I'd just driven around and watched a lot of TV. So I went to law school. Um, and uh, I guess the idea was that I'd sort of done my idealistic thing. Now I was going to go, um, you know, learn a real marketable skill and uh, get a job or, or what have you. Um, uh, and that, you know, sort of worked. Uh, I have the unique privilege of uh, graduating into two major recessions. Uh, graduated in 2002. Uh, there was still uh, the post 9 11. Um, post 9 11, uh, and it's still a little bit po post tech stock. Um, uh, um, 
uh, sorry, post tech stock, um, uh, not bubble, uh, dip, dip or something like that. So getting a job in 2002 was difficult. Also getting a job as an attorney in 2001 was, 2011 was also very difficult. Um, so um, I went to Turkey um, and uh, it will also um, uh, did, I think, dovetail with um, my interest in sort of the broader Islamic world and like what, what actually is happening uh, over there. So I think that's another key point in my uh, resume there. Uh, I lived in Turkey for five or six years. So I think specifically when I'm talking about Turkey, uh, I think, um, uh, I think I've actually got a lot more right to talk about Turkey than a lot of people who are officially writing about Turkey. Certainly anybody who's uh, talking about Turkey from the perspective of uh, the U.S. government. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't call myself a Turkey expert because you know, I think the whole idea of expertise is kind of fraught, but um, I think I know Turkey fairly well. Um, in Turkey, I worked as a corporate lawyer uh, for two years, uh, two years to the dot. Um, I had sort of always already known since law school that I wanted to do this video project. Um, and uh, I, uh, but I thought having finished law school, I should go do corporate law for two years. And it sounded kind of interesting and fun to be a corporate lawyer in Turkey uh, anyway. And it was, it was both interesting and fun. I did not work for a major British or American law firm. I went to work for a uh, you know very serious, distinguished uh, Turkish law firm. Uh, when I, I think it's the probably the only time in my life where I've gotten a job by sending out resumes and cover letters. Uh, one law firm called me up just because they thought uh, it was hilarious that a U.S. lawyer was applying to work there, um, and then they hired me, uh, and uh, it was uh, actually pretty fantastic. Uh, my work there was uh, fascinating. I was probably. Um, you know, 30% uh, uh, a uh, English translator, basically sort of, I was the only native English language speaker, so sort of cleaning up uh, language or whatnot. 30% a, uh, a professional uh, professional American uh, for marketing purposes. I think folks who know China would be familiar with that. Um, and about 40% uh, a very inexperienced attorney doing uh, incredibly fascinating, complicated work. Um, I got to do a whole bunch of stuff I guess I probably shouldn't uh, talk about uh, so publicly. I think I've probably talked about it a bit much in the comments, um, but uh, uh, it's always hard to find stuff in the comments. Um, but yeah, I just got to, a lot of, got to do a lot of really cool stuff. It was a great job, and I think I got to see a side of Turkey that certainly most journalists don't. Um, and uh, it was, it also involved a lot of sort of work in international business. Um, I think um, something I didn't mention uh, is that earlier on, a couple summers uh, around the turn of the century, I did work on Wall Street. Uh, this was not the typical Wall Street uh, internship or, or uh, experience. Uh, I basically worked for a uh, friend of the family's uh, sort of skin and bones uh, stock brokerage um, with a range of some of the best, most interesting characters I've, I've ever met. Um, it was not a prestigious job. It was not a um, uh, sort of, you know, uh, what's the word? Maybe suits is that sort of the, I guess that's more corporate law, but uh, it was not a sort of Wall Street, the movie, glamorous Wall Street job. It was sort of a bunch of, uh, Strivers trying to trying to trying to get out there and, and make a buck um, and uh, it was fascinating work And I think it really uh, sort of underpins a lot of my um, Approach to sort of financial news and, and journalism uh, who knows maybe if I'd been at Goldman Sachs or something like that I'd have been more uh, I'd have thought that people had a better a uh, better sense of what was going on uh, in, in U.S. financial circles, but uh, uh, I was not uh, at Goldman Sachs. I was at, uh, I guess I probably, well, actually, it's, I think it's long out of business now, but, um, but yeah, I was at, uh, you know, the mom and pop shop down the street, smoking Marvel Wed 100s, watching John Wayne movies, uh, punching in million dollar trades. Um, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was a great experience and I think uh, gave me a bit of insight um, I took the Series 7 security, I, I can't even remember what these 
things are they're long lapsed but i got a couple licenses that i think made me technically a stockbroker but that was really only a couple summers and a couple years in college where i thought that might be something i wanted to pursue um i did not in fact pursue it just because i i thought that um i didn't really understand the dynamic of sort of sales uh in in the economy and how important it was so i just thought i would be ripping people off trying to tell people that i had some kind of expertise in um in securities markets uh so I, I i i guess i was intimidated and it didn't go for it but uh i do think that and also i wanted to go work in dc public schools uh i'm sorry if i'm rambling here but hey 30 people are still watching this so i'm just gonna keep going um the uh uh so yeah i did have that wall street experience uh which i thought was worth name checking back around the turn of the century so sort of you know 1999 2000 um in between 2012 and 2014, I worked for a corporate law firm in Turkey, so I got to see a lot of stuff. Um, so I guess that's my sort of professional experience. That's my um, uh, educational experience. I should probably now back up a little bit and talk about this channel and why I do this channel. Um, I've always, um, I'd say probably since college, I've been really engaged politically, and I've just always really enjoyed um, engaging with this kind of stuff. Uh, and I read, I just sort of read all the time. Uh, actually, lately, I've been having some real trouble. I'm a bit worried because I think I'm not reading as much as I used to because I've been too sucked into Twitter, um, and that bothers me. Um, you know, I'm down to finishing like a book a week, um, which is uh, really bad for me, you know, and, and I also before I was sort of sucked into Twitter, I would just read long reads all week. You know, I'd read long profiles or uh, articles on stuff, uh, you know, both my online and offline reading experience used to be much better. Um, and that's been something that's been bugging me this year. Uh, but I'm a huge reader. Uh, that's sort of where I feel like I've, I've formed a lot of my opinions. You know, rather than um, read some op-ed somewhere, um, I, I I tend to read books. Um, I've you know I've read I talk about Turkey in an offhand manner, but I have read dozens and dozens of books about Turkish history and Turkish Turkish experience. Before I did my series on Yemen, uh, I read three or four books uh, on Yemen, basically. It's sort of everything, not everything, but, you know, the sort of the three most current books that are available in English and also plowed through uh, a number of research reports from places from international crisis groups. So that's, you know, I, and I don't even really consider that work. I mean, that's what I used to do for fun. Um, so that's sort of always been something about me since, uh, well, since uh, 2004, anyway. Um, I don't mention this too much, but... Uh, uh, I think I did mention that as an undergrad, I partied very, very, very hard uh, and uh, very intensely. Uh, I was a bit of a um, uh, John Belushi sort of character from Animal House. I don't know if all you guys are too young to remember that, but uh, that, uh, that was that was me. Um, in 2004, I stopped drinking um, through... Uh, I, uh, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't, generally, I'm, you're not supposed to talk about that. But uh, but if anybody is having a pro difficulty with substance abuse, I have a number of uh, um, suggestions uh, and uh, stuff that's worked out really well for me because uh, I definitely would uh, describe myself as someone who had a serious substance abuse problem. And that ended in 2004. Uh, well, so far, I uh, haven't, haven't felt the need to take a drink since 2004. Um, and I think since then, I got a lot more serious about my sort of passion to understand the world, basically, um, and, and started really, uh, mostly because I had so much time on my hands. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm not somebody who watches sports. Uh, television was a little harder to access back in 04. Um, I've never been a, uh, you know, enthusiastic uh, dater. I, I just, you know, really enjoyed it. Uh, sort of a baseline nerdery, uh, I think, uh, that I've established. Um, there have been a couple things that sort of sent me in certain directions. Uh, I had always um, had a sense that something was wrong um, with the way that the criminal justice system works in the United States, um, mostly because I used to get arrested a lot uh, because of those substance abuse problems. 
Um, and I had a sense of, you know, so much um, if, of the sort of anti-Black Lives Matter or anti, um, uh, yeah, I will use the term anti-progressive uh, movement uh, on, on mass incarceration and these issues boils down to, well, you know, if they weren't breaking the law, nothing would have happened or something like that. Um, well, I, as a white guy in an affluent community, broke the law all the time, got caught all the time, um, and the consequences were essentially nil because I was a white guy. Um, and I always knew that. And uh, even you know, back in the days of, of uh, reading, of eagerly reading National Review, and, and uh, I never watched Fox News because cable news is for idiots. But um, uh, you know, even back in those days, I'd read these articles uh, about um, issues of race and crime and this that, and other thing, and I knew they were bullshit. So that was always something that was sort of going on in the back of my head, but I'd never really took it. I just wasn't that interested. I don't know what's the word here. I mean, I was interested. I'd read books. I'd read articles. I'd, you know, have arguments, uh, this, that, and the other thing. Um, but on that particular issue, I got sort of radicalized by a class I took in law school. Um, it was run by a judge. Actually, yes, uh, there was a class I took in law school, and also that semester I had an internship um, in the D.C. Superior Court. Um, so I actually, for the first time, instead of just reading about this stuff and uh, experiencing uh, really lenient uh, treatment during my own arrests, um, I... Uh, I actually got to see what happens in DC courtrooms and uh, realizing I, this was one moment I was sitting, this wasn't something that was part of my job. I was just uh, just interested. So I was sitting in the back of a drug court um, watching this high school kid who, who in the DC public schools, it was quite an accomplishment to have made it to his senior year. Um, but he was in this this drug court program was supposedly a, a, a great gift to him um, that instead of being flat out incarcerated for smoking pot, he was given this weird, this very complicated regime of drug tests and this, that, and the other thing. And every time he failed the drug test, he had to spend the weekend in jail. And I was, you know, this is, this is pitched, to, this is the progressive, this is the awesome, you know, new way to do things. And I was like, what a goddamn catastrophe this guy is losing every weekend of his senior year making his life infinitely and already much more complicated life than i can imagine making it infinitely more complicated for committing crimes that i committed every weekend of my high school and middle school career um and that that one experience sitting in that one courtroom was like i, I gotta do something um and you know um <laughs> Could have, you know, gotten a job to actually work on those issues and, and further the cause. I could have, you know, made, you know, gotten a job where I made real money and could make sizable donations to that. Cause no, uh, instead I, I made some YouTube videos. Um, but that's what that was the response that that, that I, I wanted to make. So if you if you go to the YouTube, um, if you go to my video list, you can click a drop down and go to oldest. And those are the first videos uh, of the More Freedom Foundation were specifically dealing with the drug war and just sort of how insane it was. Uh, those three videos are, uh, uh, I think, indifferently produced, but uh, kind of interesting. And they sort of each look at ways that the drug war um, serves purposes that are not the purposes that it's supposed to serve. Um, and I, you know, I was very, very, um, you know, interested to get those out there, and I thought I was making a huge difference. Um, uh, but you know, I, I don't think I have. Um, but I still think those are worth watching because, uh, and I think those there's themes there that 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 go through the entire channel. Just the idea that you know these government policies don't ever mean what they're supposed to mean, uh, they, or the motivation behind them. And the uh, the effects. Uh, it's very very unlikely that um, uh, that they will have anything to do with the policies as written uh, or the arguments that politicians make for them. Um, I think that's been a theme throughout this channel. So I uh, once again, you know, sort of I moved to Turkey uh, without a job, um, and uh, you know, also had had ideas that I was going to you know do something more more interesting and important than being a lawyer or something like that. Um, and, you know, didn't really come up with anything. Uh, 
but while I was there, I cut together, edited those videos that I'd shot recently, you know, shot uh, prior, put those videos out uh, with the hopes that they would blow up and, and I could be a YouTuber, and uh, they did not, um, which is uh, actually for the best, because if they had blown up, I probably wouldn't have had that, that really fascinating experience uh, working for a Turkish corporate law firm. Um, so those videos came out uh, before... Um, the two years that I worked at the corporate law firm were really intense. I, I did have just have this YouTube channel that, you know, put up maybe, you know, three, three to 10 views a day or something like that. There was just not, not much, not much going on there. Um, and, uh, I would be able to do a video every six months or so, uh, in the very, very long, uh, period of this channel not being a success, people would be like, oh, why don't you get a job and you can do videos on the side? Um, and admittedly, my job at the corporate law firm was very, very intense, but but I, I'd already tried that. You know, I tried to do videos and work full time and that, it actually did not work. Um, I, I managed a video every six months or so. Um, uh, talking about, those are some of the early videos down there, talking about, um, a range of uh, range of issues, uh, just stuff that had pissed me off uh, in my reading. Um, yeah, I guess there's only two or three videos after after that um, before sort of the big shift. Um, so my job at the Turkish law firm was um, frankly fascinating um, because I was the only native English language speaker there, and certainly the only uh, New York barred attorney, though honestly, you know, most of the guys there were better um, U.S. attorneys than I was at that point. I had no experience, um, but uh, you know, I would just get sort of slotted in on a lot of really, really cool stuff. Um, and then in so I'd started in the beginning of 2012. And then in May 2013, something happened in Turkey um, that was very important for my legal career and also very important for my YouTube career. Um, uh, how to talk about Gezi Park. Uh, I did recently, but I, it's, it's probably one of the most significant events in my life, which I feel a little guilty about because it was um, an extraordinary experience for Turkey, but not necessarily a positive one. Um, I think there's a lot of people on one side of the uh, the political divide who would who would say that Gezi was a terrible thing, uh, start to finish, uh, you know, the result of foreign plotters or this, that, and thing. And then there's a lot of people, uh, more of my friends, who participated in Gezi and saw it as this incredibly hopeful thing, only to see those hopes dashed. Um, so for me, it's it still remains uh, the some of the most exciting and formative times in my life. Uh, gosh, as a, as a 34 year old, uh, I had, you know, which is amazing. I mean, it, it, it's, I, I can't think of Gezi Park, the events around Gezi Park, anything other than positively. Uh, but I know that that's a very different experience uh, for my Turkish viewers and my Turkish friends. Um, so I feel a little guilty about that. Um, so what happened in May of 2013, um, Erdogan, a guy who was previously very heavily supported by the United States, uh, had uh, run Turkey for, I believe, about 10 years at that point. For some reason, I can never remember exactly when Erdogan came into power because there was some weirdness where he was, he, had, he was still working off the consequences of some kind of incarceration, so he couldn't technically be prime minister, just so somebody else was a prime minister after the AK party won the election. So I can never quite, it's, it was 2002 or so. Uh, 2003, Erdogan came to power. In 2013, um, after he had successfully, there was great economic success in Turkey for about 11 years. Turkey, uh, there had been a series of constitutional issues between Erdogan, his AK party, and the military that had traditionally run uh, Turkey and uh, reserved the right to sort of intervene so there have been a lot of things that had changed. Uh, my first uh, couple of years in Turkey, I was a fan of Erdogan, actually. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm admitting a lot of, you know, Iraq war, <laughs> Iraq war supporter, Erdogan supporter. I'm admitting a lot of past bad ideas on this cast, on this cast because, I mean, from the U.S. perspective, I mean, I was an American lawyer who was working in Turkey, um, not exactly legally, um, but um, 
it was a uh, something that wouldn't have been possible without the sort of stability that I saw, unfairly or fairly, as coming from uh, the AG Party and its economic policies. So it was it was it was kind of um, uh, oh I said I just <laughs> Mustafa Tan Taner Tan Tan says Gezi Park represents the real Turkish Ataturk spirit, and I, I agree. Um, not that I'd be able to say that, um, but. Uh, so Erdogan, uh, there'd been this incredible pressure building up uh, against Erdogan. Um, and in Gezi, in May 2013, uh, the, the Gezi Park protests, that sort of burst. Um, and uh, it's interesting, I was on a late May. Uh, I had organized a really terrible bachelor party for a friend of mine. And uh, we walked through Gezi Park. Um, and what was going on at Gezi Park on that Tuesday was a bunch of hippies um, painting signs or something like that. So I, I consider it incredibly privileged that I stumbled through the beginnings of Gezi Park uh, completely unwittingly uh, with a bunch of drunk yabanja. Um, and uh, so we stumbled through there. And what happened was uh, these uh, construction is another theme in Turkey, um, you know, sort of environmental stuff thrown out the window and every, every green space being turned into turned into mega malls in Turkey. That's the caricature. Um, and that's also been a real grievance. Um, so these guys were just sort of, you know, maybe, I don't know, less than a hundred sort of hippie types who decided to occupy Gezi Park to keep it from being turned into a mall. Um, I mean, it was just, it's amazing how tone deaf these, 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 uh, uh, Turkish leaders were. It, uh, it's, uh, um, these Ak Party folks were. I mean, it was a park with a lot of significance in the middle of Taksim Square, a uh, historical place of protest and the center of Istanbul. And they wanted to just sort of plow it under and create a uh, mini mall. Now, admittedly, it was not a very attractive park. Nobody really went there uh, much. Um, it was Taksim Square was and remains, you know, a little bit grim and not a lot of fun when there aren't uh, tons of people uh, 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 protesting. Um, so anyway, these folks were occupying Gezi Park to save it. And on a Friday morning, uh, I believe it was a Friday morning, um, the police came in and just crushed it um, in the most brutal, needlessly brutal way possible. And uh, it went out everywhere. It went on Facebook. I think it was, yeah, I think it was, a, was it a Friday, May 31st? I don't quite recall, but I, I got this uh, uh, Facebook invite that tens of thousands of other people had gotten and said, come to the gas party, uh, gas party, come to the gas party, uh, come get tear gassed. And uh, I didn't have a choice because I lived on the other side of Toxum Square and they had shut down the metro. Um, but also I, I was really fascinated to see it. And I don't, I'm, I, I don't, I think it probably talk about the Gezi Park protests for a long time. Um, but basically uh, long and short of it, I got tear gassed a lot. Um, but also uh, for two weeks, uh, the protesters managed to occupy Gezi Park on a massive scale. It was, um, I think it was, it was it, uh, yeah, on a massive scale. Um, there were uprisings throughout the country involving estimated millions of people. It was an extraordinary thing to be a part of. Um, uh, got tear gas a lot, got the experience of, uh, I was not in, involved in any way in sort of like the organization or this, that, and the other thing, but, uh, you know, got to be sort of on the front lines of some protests and, and sort of look, uh, cops in the eye as, as they shot things at me. Um, and it was, you know, it was, uh, it was, uh, one of the high points of my life. Um, and, but it also actually, um, kind of radicalized me a little bit. It was sort of, it was, it did sort of give me a sort of what the fuck am I doing, um, you know, with my life uh, kind of feeling. Like I just didn't, you know, doing corporate law didn't seem that interesting or exciting um, after spending weeks or to a lesser degree that whole summer just sort of watching um, watching people really fight for their country um, and, and try to bring about real change um in in a in in the most vital way possible um i mean how so i think gezi was uh, really um 
a formative thing. And I don't know, I don't, certainly don't think I'd have started doing uh, the More Freedom Foundation full time if it weren't for that experience uh, with Gezi. Um, but I still had a job. Um, uh, however, uh, Gezi Park, the protests, the, the summer that uh, also helped me deal with that job issue. Um, because uh, I was working for a Turkish law firm in a market where there were plenty of U.S. and British law firms. Uh, so after Gezi Park, the sort of gangbusters economy of Turkey, it did continue to a degree. Uh, I've got videos on Turkey's zombie economy, but the amount of foreign business plummeted. Um, it got much, much smaller. So most of that English language business was now taken care of by the U.S. and British law firms, meaning my very distinguished, very, 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 very uh, highly expert um, Turkish law firm all of a sudden didn't have much English language business. And as uh, longtime viewers know, um, uh, my Turkish is, is uh, quite embarrassing considering the amount of time uh, that I spent uh, in Turkey. Uh, so also, um, while people were willing to fudge things to let me work on sort of international and U.S. based matters, I can't think of anything more ridiculous than an American lawyer trying to navigate Turkish law issues. So they were quite friendly to me at the law firm, and I think they were happy to have me, you know, continue to sit around. Um, but um, I wasn't really doing anything. This this sort of extraordinarily fascinating uh, uh, job that I had very quickly. Uh, got to a point where I was sort of sitting around at work uh, waiting uh, and then corporate law in Turkey just as much as in the United States is sort of a FaceTime thing. Uh, I mean, I was in good with the partners and I was a sort of weird special case, so I probably could have left at five if I'd wanted to, but I don't think anybody at the law firm would have had any respect for me. I'm not sure if anybody at the law firm had any respect for me, but they certainly wouldn't have any if I left at five, so I'd just sort of be sitting at the office for 10 hours a day. Uh, with not much to do. What did happen was, um, uh, which was another great opportunity, was uh, at some point that year, and I think actually the year before, um, somebody came in and was like, oh, we've got these clauses that have started showing up in our contracts, Rob, and we just really don't understand it because it doesn't make any sense. Why are all of our um, our financings and whatnot, why do they all have a clause dealing with U.S. law? We're in Turkey now. Uh, and that's sort of how I started to become knowledgeable about the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, uh, which is a um, U.S. law that is one of the most imperialist things imaginable. I've got a number of videos on it. It's very complex, so complex that I don't even understand it anymore um, because it's not something that I'm doing professionally, you know, 10 to 20 hours a week. Um, but it's a real, real sort of disgusting imposition by the U.S. Congress on every bank in the world, whether or not it has any business with uh, the United States. Uh, I'd suggest searching uh, FATCA on YouTube or on my channel, and I think you'll, you'll swiftly be as disturbed as I am. Um, so I got to honestly be, I think at some point in 2013, I think I was one of the world's foremost experts on the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, which is a very niche thing but is very, um, very useful. Um, so I don't claim to have known the FATCA legislation better than anybody else. I would probably have put myself in the top 20. Um, but what I did do that I think made me different was I actually looked at it with a critical eye. Most people looking at this legislation were from big US tax firms or big law firms or even big uh, tax and accounting firm and law firms uh, overseas who could look at this law and say, Ooh, we're going to make a ton of money. Um, whereas I was like, what are the historical and political implications of this incredibly terrible law? Um, so sitting at this law firm, I knew all this stuff about all this stuff. And um, I had a YouTube channel. Um, and uh, I had all this sort of expertise about something that was tremendously boring and nobody was really writing about, nobody really cared about. Um, so I was like, well, why don't I write about this and say what I think is going on with it? Um, and I did, and I published an essay on Amazon, and I put together a um, YouTube video to promote it. Uh, it was like a skit. It's pretty cute. I think it's still like my third most watched video on this channel uh, five or six years later. Um, 
uh, called uh, FATCA, FATCA Explained in Four Minutes. Um, and it took off. I was kind of blown away. I was, I was making good advertising revenue off of it. Um, I uh, was selling a whole ton of essays on Amazon. And I was like, oh, wait a second. I am sitting... Um, <laughs> Um, I am sitting in, uh, well, it's interesting. Martin Pierre Frenet uh, says, the big question is, where did you find the girl you did the video with? What is that story? Uh, uh, she's a local actress in Istanbul uh, from California. Actually, she's not in Istanbul anymore. A very dear friend. Um, I think at that point, where did I find her at that point? Because later... We actually formed an improv troupe in Istanbul uh, doing sort of improv comedy stuff. Um, but I'm not sure. And I think I met Kelsey because she was a member of an earlier group that had done performances that I would go see. Um, and I approached her because I thought she'd be good for the part. So there you go, Martin Pierre Fernet, the history of how, how I met Kelsey from the uh, FATCA, FATCA video. Uh, good friend. Really impressive. Really impressive gal, actually. Um, um, but where were we? Um, so yes, FATCA. Uh, so it's, it's a weird thing. I think it's actually worth everybody knowing about. Um, I don't think it really reached a mass audience, but I think it reached an audience of people who really cared about FATCA. Um, and I think it, uh, uh um, I think it was useful. It was much appreciated by a lot of people and it was very successful. I sometimes wish that I did more things like that. Um, you know, really dived into sort of the, the, the moving parts of US empire and how the US exerts the incredible power it has in the world because it's not about the military. Um, and I feel like I'm too focused on that on this channel. That couldn't be less important uh, to US power. Um, I mean that's a good money spinner and uh, keeps the you know keeps the grease, the the wheels greased or something like that. What's vastly more important is U.S. financial power, and U.S. financial power is exerted in these really complicated uh, laws that nobody really takes the time to figure out and learn about. Um, and I think because of a weird professional situation that I was in, I was able to really dive in on something like that. And if this were this project were ever to, to grow and I were ever in the position to actually hire people to do stuff, I feel like um, that would be what I would hire people to do, uh, would be to, to, to sort of, I mean, I don't want to commit to that, but I have a suspicion that that would be what I would hire people to do, to really just sort of dive in on like, what does the WTO mean? Like, how does that actually work? How does the IMF really work? Not like, eh, you know, like, you know, eh, you know, screw these neoliberals or alternatively, oh, the IMF is great. Like actually like, how did these things actually work in terms of, you know, the legal ramifications? It's tremendously complicated stuff, but it's in those really complicated, boring details. That's where the empire happens. You know, that's where U.S. control is exerted. Um, and I, I do wish I'd did, a, did sort of deeper dives on that. But uh, it's at this point, it's just not consistent with producing content every week, um, filming, promoting, editing, like, you know, sort of what I'm doing. I would like to get back there. Um, but I think FATCA is a really, really good illustration of um, just how much more powerful the United States is than everybody thinks they are, thinks it is. Um, and uh, anyway, so that was a great sort of project to start off with. Um, did really, really well. And I was sitting there at the end of 2013 and I was looking at this and I was like, okay, I've got this job I go to every day that pays me very well and I do nothing. Um, but if I wasn't here, then maybe I could do this YouTube thing that is um, apparently wildly successful. My fourth video at the gate is getting tens of thousands of views and I'm making, you know, not like super amount of money, but I, you know, I think in May of 2014, 14 after I'd quit my job, I think I made like a hundred bucks off of YouTube advertising. And I was like, holy cow, like, and that's just one video. I mean, this is, this is all I need. And Turkey is very cheap and I could build something real and it'd be amazing. Um, and that did happen. It just took a lot longer than I thought. It would. <laughs> um, uh, that FATCA video, 
uh, wasn't just my most successful video from the fall of 2013 until April of 2017. It was my most successful video by a lot, like by a lot. Um, so I started doing this full time in, uh, I think, March 1st, 2014 or something like that. And I've done a video every Tuesday since without fail, sometimes two videos a week. Uh, which I've done for three weeks in a row now. I'm very proud of myself. Um, and very occasionally uh, a full week of videos. Uh, that's always really helpful um, uh, for the channel. Uh, drives a lot of growth, but also, uh, you know, almost kills me every time I do it. Um, but um, the... Um, sorry, I got drawn into the comments a little bit there. The... Um, what was I even talking about? Fatka. Oh, yeah. So the channel started. And yeah, the channel um, failed to do well uh, for quite some time. Um, the, in 2014, um, I told my parents, my friends, and family, I'm just going to try this for like three, you know, three to six months. And uh, we'll be, you know, you know, and then, then I just want give to it, give it a shot, see if it works. Um, I'm still doing it uh, four and a half years later, uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, my friends and family are a little uh, now realize that I'm probably going to keep doing it. Um, but uh, I think rightly we're a little uh, little miffed at uh, the way I uh, just sort of kept on going and kept on going and finding an excuse and doing this and everything. Um, so in 2014, sort of big projects were. Um, it was sort of scattershot, actually, now that I think about it. It was just sort of this, that, the other thing. Um, and I'm still, I still try to be scattershot. Um, I like the fact that I can cover anything I want to cover. Um, though I've noticed I've fallen away from that recently, or at least when I want to be successful. Um, but it was quite scattershot. And what I was primarily developing over the course of 2014 was my playlist on US criminal justice, which remains incredibly important to me. Um, it was interesting because as I was, uh, I believe it was the summer of 2014, was also when Ferguson came to everybody's attention. Um, and uh, it, it felt good to be putting out um, something that dealt directly with those issues. And I'm still very proud of um, that playlist. And I actually feel kind of bad um, that uh, I think it's race and injustice in the United States is the playlist. And I feel bad that I haven't gotten to those issues uh, in a while um, because those were initially very, very important to me. Um, so that was 2014. In 2015, um, I uh, launched the uh, military industrial complex playlist, which is actually front and center on the channel page today um, because Living in Turkey, being surrounded by journalists and people who worked for the U.S. government and the U.K. government to overthrow Assad, it was impossible to avoid um, just the ridiculous of all that. And I think that I'm very proud of that series. I think that series is a, sort of an outgrowth of um, both my experience of being an Iraq war supporter my decade of reading after that, um, sort of realizing how wrong I had been, what the forces sort of underpinning that were, what the history behind it was. And I think I really, in that military industrial complex series, sort of boil things down, put them all together in a way that's interesting. Um, in 2016, uh, throughout 2015, 2016, I got more and more angry about the US involvement in Syria and uh, started paying more and more attention. It's embarrassing that actually my, first three or four years in Turkey, I paid no attention to this, this disastrous war that was developing uh, uh, down, down south. Um, so in uh, the fall of 2016, I did a big series on Syria. And that was something I spent a lot of time developing, still very proud of and still doing installments of today. Um, so throughout this time period, the um, the the channel was uh, unsuccessful, <laughs> to, to say the least. I was looking back at some of the data uh, for um, like that military industrial complex series. So I pretty much upload a video and it gets, I, I can 
be very confident if I upload a video, even one of these live videos that I put no promotion on and then I just, just start doing, I'm pretty confident I'm, I'll pass a thousand views now. Like the initial days of those military industrial complex videos, like I was getting the first day out and the way almost every YouTube video um, lo looks, except for that sort of, you know, 5% that develop long-term legs or might get more successful, almost all of them look like this, like sort of a, you know, like that and then um so if that makes any sense so there's the first day is the biggest view day and then it sort of you know might add views going on unless it sort of takes off and, and later on um and so yeah i would get like 60 views and i would have been excited back then like in in, in 2015 i'd have been enthusiastic after doing this for a year um my measurement like even even into early 2017, though at that point I was getting pretty depressed, I'd be excited if my videos had been viewed by 300 people like a week later. So by early 2017, um, I was doing this channel and uh, had been doing it for um, three and a half years. I've been, uh, yeah, three years, I guess in March 2017, I've been doing this for three years. And, um, you know, I had 10 videos that had been viewed more than a thousand times. Um, and it wasn't so much the money, though that remains an issue. Um, um, it was just the fact that I was pouring my life into this stuff and literally nobody was watching. Um, so I had had one last series that I really wanted to talk about, Saudi Arabia. Um, and I did. And that went well. Um, so that everybody's lying about Islam series was like when I finally sort of got the right mix of um, keywords, content, this, that, and the other thing. And uh, it has uh, revolutionized this channel and my life, um, which is sort of how we got to where we are today. Um, I, you know, have gone from getting, basically traffic has gone up by a factor of 10 in the and then on a couple days it's been up by a factor of 50. Um, I do not uh, absolutely at this point even with the channel uh, you know for those of you who might be interested in YouTube yourselves like uh, the channel that I think is now I consider a reasonable success is absolutely not paying me enough uh, to live. Uh, I got an apartment for the first six months of this year and I uh, did, uh, you know, pretty much had to give it up because I could not afford it. Um, I'm going to, you know, now take on another apartment, I think in October, because um, I've saved up a bit of money, um, but uh, by, you know, not living anywhere. Um, but uh, yeah, it's not there yet. But I, I think I can really see a path forward and a path to eventual sustainability, hopefully in the next year or so. Which is nice, and it's crazy that it's taken me five years to get here, but it's a great place to be. Um, it's an uh, incredible privilege that I get to uh, sort of talk about, um, you know, politics, history uh, with you guys. Uh, show up and um, uh, sort of uh, get involved and... Uh, I'm tremendously grateful to all you folks. Uh, it's uh, it's it's a it's a tremendous privilege. I'm a very very lucky guy, and I'm definitely going to keep on doing it. I'm finally uh, happy to report that I've finally broken sort of a logjam on the avoiding the British Empire book. I've still got a lot more to do, but um, you know it's funny. I, I promised it for November 2017. I think it's looking like it'll probably be November 2018, but. I'd never written a book before, um, uh, but I'm very proud of it. It's not just about the British Empire and the U.S. Empire at this point. It, it's kind of weirdly turned into my sort of history of everything, and I think it it really dives in deeply into um, the reasons why the world is the way it is. Um, and I think it's going to be a tremendously useful thing, and I'm really excited to get it out into your hands. Uh, but yeah, I need to write it. Um, so yeah, uh, that will be the next big push. I'll do a whole bunch of videos around it, um, and uh, I hope it's sooner rather than later. Um, so yeah, I, I, uh, I'm tremendously optimistic, tremendously grateful to all you folks. So those are my qualifications. This is um, uh, this is uh, this is uh, yeah my credentials, such as they were. I hope you found that helpful. 
Uh, shall we go about um, comments, questions? Uh, Logo Cool Extreme asks, Christ, how big is this book? It's getting bigger. Um, I had sort of, I guess the Everybody's Lying About Islam book was um, about 20,000 words, uh, which uh, came to 70 pages in the, in the, in the paperback. Um, this thing's now 70,000 words. So it's going to be about, it's going to be easily 200 pages, two or 300 pages. Um, and yeah, it sort of keeps ballooning. Um, I, uh, had a, uh, actually sent it to John, who you guys may, uh, know, uh, pretty, you guys know from, uh, the conversations we have, which are sadly probably over because he's now, he's now in law school, um, and is very busy. Uh, but we'll see if we can get him back on the channel. Um, but yeah, I actually uh, worked with John Coombs to edit an earlier draft, and I think he pushed me in maybe too academic a direction, uh, but it was tremendously useful to get his insight, um, and I think made it a vastly better book. He made a number of suggestions that made the process much longer, but I think it made for a, for a much better book um, that I really like to finish. But yes, it is quite long. Um, Cletus223, getting back to my question last time, do they think support for women's rights is broad in Turkey or mainly just among the urban elites? That's a man, that's a great question. That's a question that um, I often, uh, you know, pondered myself. Um, you know, I also ask my question, myself that question about the United States uh, often. Um, but, um, but yeah, or, Six years in Turkey, um, you know, thinking I knew things. You know, the only thing I can really say for certain is that most Turks don't like Arabs. That's uh, that's really the only thing I know for certain about Turkey. Um, but I think Turkey is a um, uh, Turkey is a country that's sort of in constant ferment, and I think there is real support for women's rights in a range of arenas. But of course, that's always like, what exactly does that mean? I knew very um, very secular, Western-oriented people in Turkey who, when it came to sort of interpersonal relationships and expectations of women, it wasn't, um, you know, the, I saw very little in my circles sort of abuse or, or, um, or uh, um, negativity of that sort but but also just sort of in the expectations the turkish women put on themselves it was sort of very old-fashioned in a way though there are people with the old-fashioned approaches in the united states basically i'm sort of i'm sort of bloviating i mean it's a question that um i think i don't have a concrete answer to because maybe i'm a little too close to the question having sort of dated turkish women have had having um a lot of Turkish friends, um, but I think the idea that, um, I think it, the answer to your question depends on what exactly you're, you're thinking. Are you thinking that it's like, you know, Afghanistan? Fuck no. Um, it's, um, I think that the, uh, out in the countryside, it is can significantly more conservative than like the countryside of Alabama. Um, but it's not, you know, it's not, it's not like super, anyway, I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm succeeding in answering this question effectively, but I think it's more complicated than the framing of that question. Um, if that makes any sense. Um, Otaku Babiker asks, as for my earlier question, are you interested in covering countries in the Middle East like Sudan? Qatar. Uh, I am interested in covering all countries. Um, I think I've gotten less, uh, I think I've gotten a little more careful recently. Um, I think I sort of, I feel like I know enough to say things about Saudi Arabia, and I say a lot of things about Saudi Arabia. I feel like I know enough to, to say things about um, Yemen and Syria um, and Turkey, certainly. Um, and I'm, I'm interested in actually sort of, instead of just sort of picking, um, 
you know, going into a country blind now and sort of saying, this is what I think based on, you know, these three articles I've read. Um, I'm more interested now in sort of slowly adding to that list of countries to really doing the necessary research about a country. So of course, I'd love to make it to Sudan and Qatar, but those are not really on my short list of the countries to, to go to next. Um, that said, I mean, if something, I mean, there's always, uh, I was going to say if something significant happens there, but there's always significant things happening in every country. But if something goes big again, I do have one video on the Qatar crisis that I think is very surface and not, um, not doesn't actually say much about, about uh, Qatar in detail. Um, but yeah, I'm interested in all countries. I think I've gotten a little more careful. Um, like I've spent the past week wrestling with a Venezuela uh, video and it's just like, I just don't, man, like, I don't even know where to begin. I mean, everything you read about Venezuela is propaganda. Um, you've got, um, and I am not a fan of uh, Hugo Chavez, and I think a lot of the standard story that, that you know, Chavez and Maduro um, uh, uh, ran the country into the ground is absolutely true. Um, but there's also a lot of bullshit. And I think there's specifically what I'm going to address is there's a lot of bullshit about why Venezuela is in crisis right now. Um, but yeah, I just don't, I haven't done the research. I haven't read the books on Venezuela, so it's, it's very difficult for me to do. So I'm interested in covering all countries. And I think that's why I've put so much time into this avoiding the British Empire book, because what I'm doing in the book is um, attempting to look at the past 200 years, and certainly more, much more than I expected, you know, years before that as well, um, and sort of how did the world get this way? Because the story of the world now at the top level is and I don't want to like minimize resistance and, and power and diversity and this, that, and the other thing, but at the top level in terms of like why the world is the way it is, it's because of the United States and it's because of Britain um, before it. Um, so that, the reason I'm spending so much time on this and trying to put that all together is because that's the big global perspective that I think affects every country. And I think once that I've got that under my belt, I should be able to do better sort of chunks of videos. You know, I should be able to spend a month reading up on Venezuela and do a good Venezuela series. Should be able to spend a month. Actually, Sudan, I think Sudan is probably more likely that I'd get into um, than Qatar, to get to your question, um, because, um, I mean, Qatar is just so small. Um, and I feel like, unfairly probably, because I know Qatar is a very different place from the UAE. I know that UAE is a very different place from Bahrain, is a very different place from Kuwait. But I do feel that I have sort of a limited understanding of the dynamics that are involved in those countries, and they're just not a lot of people. Um, and while I do think of the Gulf countries other than, you know, as very different from Saudi Arabia, specifically because of the number of people in those countries, I talk about that in the sort of Saudi Arabia is finished video. Um, I'm just not that interested in talking a bunch about the Gulf countries. I mean, who knows? Maybe that'll that'll change. There's just not a lot of people there. Um, and actually, as I'm I'm sort of semi-consciously shifting towards a little more business commentary because I think, I mean, not to get all Marxist, I think that stuff can often be much more important than what the politicians are saying. Um, and certainly, um, the UAE, Qatar, Kuwait. Bahrain less so, Oman less so, have a really outsized impact on the world economy. So maybe I will get into that at some point, but you know, we're talking the 2020s at this point. Sudan is more likely, because that's kind of a fascinating country. And I'm sort of thinking I might sort of move into Africa, because um, I think I definitely need a lot more coverage of that. And I'll pick a country or two um, to start with. Um, Sudan uh, probably wouldn't be number one on that list, but Okay. Um, Argad Argad says, oh, to that earlier question, I lived in Afyon, I believe in Turkey, for five months. Generally speaking, women's rights is better than Arabs or Iranians. Absolutely, no question. I'm sorry. Um, this is a better way to answer that question. In terms of women's rights, I think comparing Turkey to the United States makes more sense. Um, many, not all, certainly not all, parts of Arab countries, I mean, to, to sort of generalize Arab countries is kind of ridiculous. 
Um, but Turkey's operating in a different world from most Arab countries and certainly from Iran in terms of women's rights. Um, I think Iran is actually a bit sort of closer to Turkey in terms of like where the society is. Unfortunately, the government is sort of pushing down in a pretty horrific way. But no, I mean, Turkey, I, I do think is fair to talk about its women's rights trajectory in, in comparison to the United States, but not to the United States today. I, uh, a model that I use for women's rights is I think in Turkey, it's very similar to the 1950s, okay? Like women's rights, or maybe the 60s, like there's a concession at the top level that women's rights is something that we need to care about. Um, you know, everybody was sort of, sort of waking up to the idea that women's rights is important, but you've got, um, you know, back in the, in the, and actually in many respects, Turkey is better than the United States in the 50s, 60s, or 70s. Um, it's, it's not something we really remember or think about now, but domestic violence, sort of prosecution of domestic violence and legal consequences for domestic violence, for beating your wife in the United States, wasn't much of a thing before the 1980s. Um, became a national issue and became something that people took seriously in the 1980s in the United States. And I would say that Turkey is at least legally further along than the United States in the 1980s on that particular issue. What actually happens, what actually gets prosecuted, I can't speak to that in detail, but I would say it was it's you know worse than the 1980s US. So I think that's a model I use. I think whereas certainly in you know like so, some Arab countries we're talking about you know 1850s as far as from the US perspective where they're at. Um, and you know Afghanistan we're talking about uh, um, you know I don't think I'm not sure that you know, well, some women had it as bad uh, in U.S. history or colonial history as the women in Afghanistan do, but not 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 tons. Um, but with Turkey, I think it's like U.S. 1950s. I think that's the answer to the earlier question. And thanks to Argad Argad for sort of helping me put that way. Logo Cool Extreme asks, why do you have so much trouble in covering India when you're so good at covering the U.S., Europe, China, and the Middle East? Um, that's a really good question. So I don't do many Europe videos, but I think I should do more because actually um, I would say I am more of an expert on European history than I am on uh, sort of the history of the Arab world, the Muslim world. I have always been a tremendous history dork. Um, as a kid, I used to have all the English kings after, never after Alpha the Great, because it gets kind of confusing with all those Anglo-Saxon names. But I used to be able to re list off all of the English kings from William the Conqueror down. Um, I, you know, was tremendously involved, you know, knew a lot about British history from sort of an early age. My father is sort of a convinced Anglophile. I was raised in that sort of... Um, you know, interest in English liberties and sort of whatnot. And I think since then I've been moving west. Um, so sort of in my teens and 20s, I got more into French history, sort of worked, uh, sorry, moving east, not west. Um, so actually physically moving to Turkey, like really finally allowed me to reckon with sort of the Ottoman Empire, what that meant for European history. But I always, I mean, at least a couple of times a year, I devour an extensive history of Europe whether it's contemporary Europe, uh, you know, Renaissance Europe, uh, ancient Europe. I mean, I, I know a lot about Europe and feel quite confident arguing with anybody about European history, which is, I think, freaking hilarious because I get a lot of comments from people, you know, screaming about how I, you know, prefer Islam to Western civilization. And I'm just like, you, and my response to that is usually, you motherfucker. Um, like, I have forgotten more about European history than the entire European right combined. Um, but, you know, the, I have forgotten more about European history than the entire European right combined will ever know. Um, and, and I'm happy to defend that proposition. Um, so I think a lot of I've since become more and more involved in the history of the Ottoman Empire. I think I've got a pretty solid handle on that, sort of what, you know, what happened, what that meant. And then when I do the reading, when I when I sit down and read the books, as I have on Saudi Arabia and as I have on Yemen, um, I'm, I'm and other Middle Eastern countries and Syria, 
I am sort of confident enough to, to sort of speak knowledgeably. Um, with, so that's sort of U.S., Europe, U.S., I live in the U.S., I've read a lot of U.S. history. I, um, you know, I think I have a better grasp of U.S. history and politics than pretty much anybody in the U.S. Congress. Um, I'm a little arrogant, but I'm happy to say that. Um, so yeah, U.S., Europe, I mean, that's, you know, I know this shit, um, and I'm quite confident talking about that. The Middle East, um, over the past six, you know, seven or eight years, I've really engaged with that. Um, and, and I know, you know, I've, I've learned enough to cover that. And, and I do, the, I read the books to read, to cover the, the, uh, the places. I'm learning more about India and Pakistan. I, I'm just, just, just working through um, a book, on, a very detailed book on uh, British imperial history. And I think it's, it's helping me to, sorry, specifically British India. And I think that's helping me get a grasp on the issues that face India today. But I'm just nowhere near there. So with Yemen or Saudi Arabia or um, Syria, I feel like I can read four or five books and I can sort of grasp it. With China, um, just because China is something that we all have to engage with, um, I can't claim to be an expert. I can't claim to um, you know, have the granular knowledge of what's happening in Chongqing versus Xinjiang versus um, you know, Shenzhou or Guangzhou. I mean, I, I can't claim to have that expertise, but I've probably read 20 books, you know, on China and specifically its larger relations. So my China coverage is decent because I'm dealing with primarily sort of U.S. versus China politics on a larger scale. So I think I'm confident to sort of talk about that. And if you look at a lot of my China videos, I'm not really dealing with China politics in detail. I'm dealing with U.S. perceptions of Chinese politics. Um, but China's actually a lot easier than India because China has functioned as a unified sort of polity, more or less, you know, less than than is I think generally perceived, but has, you know, for certainly for four or five hundred years, and arguably for two thousand years. So it's an easier through through line to follow. India is not like that. India is like an entire world of politics, knowledge, and history in a single country. And like getting a grasp on that, I absolutely, um, my Afghanistan coverage is crap because to do Afghanistan, you need to understand Pakistan, which is another really complicated country. And to understand Pakistan, you need to understand India and Pakistan. So that whole just mess is something that I am very aware of. I should be covering more, but I just haven't read enough. And India is just that complicated. Um, so yeah, um, that's that would be why I don't cover India um, and Pakistan and Afghanistan. And I know that's a real problem and something I have to address. But man, like it's a lot more, a lot more that needs to done. Um, that needs to be done. Um, let's see here. Um, Oh, that's uh, the sunny three 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 asks why don't you make any videos about North Africa? That is an excellent question. I have you know when I first put together the everybody's lying about Islam sort of list of videos I wanted to do, I really intended to do a serious deep dive on Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia. I've been to. Uh, um, I've actually been to Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia, um, and uh, was generally impressed with what I found there. Um, I've wanted to sort of do that reading, but I haven't done that reading yet. Um, and I'm actually quite optimistic about North Africa. Um, there are tremendous challenges, tremendous problems, but I, I do think that that um, is a place we should be optimistic about. And I want to do those videos, but I want to do them right. Um, and I just haven't had the time to do the do the appropriate research, but I agree with Sunny three 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 three. I should absolutely do um, North Africa. Argad Argad is. Are you interested in making a video about Iraq in the near future? And I would say yes. I think Iraq is a place where I sort where I screwed up. Um, I did some coverage of. I think the my Iraq coverage, which at this point was mostly around the time when ISIS came to um, came to power was, uh, you know, I think some of the worst videos I've got um, on this channel. 
There's a Syria video also that I think is pretty surface and crap that deals with, I think it's something along the lines of the U.S. is pursuing Assad's policy in Iraq or something like that. So I think my Iraq coverage uh, sucks, to be quite honest. Um, I don't think there's, there's not, I mean, there's not much in there that like, you know, uh, necessarily that's like completely wrong, but I think the conclusions that I arrived at were incorrect and surface and sort of too comparative to European history. And um, yeah, I think my Iraq coverage um, is very lacking. But once again, I just haven't had the time to do the research um, uh, to sort of correct that problem. Um, so like, I think I've got a really good Iraq video, sort of who, you know, from the earlier years, like who, who is the US really fighting in Iraq? Um, but once again, that's not covering Iraqi politics and what's actually happening in Iraq. That's covering sort of the U.S. imperial interaction with Iraq, which I think I'm better with. But as far as, so the main problem I think with my Iraq coverage earlier on was that I was like, yeah, we should just split it up. Like, screw it, Sykes-Picot was garbage. Um, but um, I think that really sells the Iraqis short and um, sort of uh, negates um, the, uh, I guess, almost 100 years that Iraq now has as, a, as an entity. And I think that's, I think that's wrong. And I think my coverage of Iraq sucks. And yes, that is something else I need to get to. Okay. Um, um, Essa Tanus asks, what do you think of Idlib? Uh, that's something I may have gotten wrong, but I'm still not 100% sure I've gotten wrong. Um, my most recent Syria video said that I thought Idlib would last for much longer. There seems, I mean, there's a lot of... Um, uh, certainly, you know, I haven't watched uh, South Front in a while, uh, the uh, YouTube channel that's more or less the voice of Russia and Syria. Um, but I know that um, a lot of folks expect Idlib to be invaded uh, very soon. Uh, bombing has been stepped up. I mean, who knows? I haven't looked at Syria news today. Perhaps there's already uh, serious fighting going on. I expected Idlib to last much, last much longer. Um, I could be wrong about that. And uh, when that happens, I'll run a correction video and saying, you know, I got it wrong again. Uh, I am not infallible. Um, the uh, I'm not the Pope. Um, that's a different issue. Um, but uh, um, yeah, so Idlib, I still kind of expect Idlib to last longer because of that weird dynamic with Turkey being in there. Um, and uh, yeah, who's to say, but with the Turkish financial crisis, I don't know that Turkey has the wherewithal to defend Idlib for as long as I expected it to. Um, so I, mean, I just don't know. Um, things are developing very rapidly in Idlib, and uh, we will see. Uh, I hope that uh, people don't die. Um, let's see. Uh, do we have a question? Kure Search and Kuru says, hi, handsome. Well, hello. Um, uh, Cletus223 asks, I've got another question. I've heard people who support modern views, example, secularism, freedom of speech, etc., in Turkey are generally a tiny minority, and the vast majority don't agree with that. I think that's wrong. Um, I think there's tremendous support for secularism in Turkey, but the question is what that means, because it means different things to different people. For millions of Turks, that means a full Western lifestyle. Um, for others, that means uh, respect for the, the republic that um, Ataturk set up, um, that, that you know, they want more respect for Islam and the ability to live more Islamic lives. Once again, exactly what that means is very different. Almost no Turks have any interest in sort of Wahhabi extreme Islam because that's something they associate with Arabs. Uh, they don't feel like Saudi Arabia uh, should have the leadership of Islam. They think the Turks should, because that's the way it was during the Ottoman Empire. Um, and that is a very different set of beliefs and approaches. Um, you know, I think most of the sort of, um, I believe, I could be, I'm getting a little in the weeds here, but I believe most suicide bombings carried out by Turks are linked to just a single sect of guys in one, you know, southern Turkish town. Um, it's, you know, essentially the equivalent of a little little sect of school shooters. Um, you know, it was kind of a crazy aberration. Um, so I think one of the, the great things in the run-up to um, the new constitution, 
the AK party, the sort of pro-Islam party, um, not not the whole AK party. I think it was just one faction in the AK party floated the idea of the new constitution not being as so pro-secular. And even with all the power that Erdogan and the AK party has, they floated that sort of saw what the reaction was and were like, oh no, sorry, we won't we won't bother with that. So the new crazy Turkish constitution that gives Erdogan all the power he wants is still a secular constitution because there's enough support among AK party supporters, among Turks generally, for it to remain a secular constitution. Um, you know, Erdogan talks a lot about democracy. What he means about democracy is very different, obviously, from uh, what others uh, in the West might mean when they talk about democracy. So I, I, I think Turkey, I have talked, um, I think in the why Turkey will never be Saudi Arabia video and why I'm still optimistic about Turkey, I talk about exactly these questions in some detail. So I know, I think uh, Cletus, the people who say that only a minority supports modern views are um, I think wrong, but it depends on what like, you know, do the majority of Turks want to be Sweden? Hell no. Um, but um, they don't want to be, they certainly don't want to be Saudi Arabia or Iran. Uh, and while there's the Ottoman Empire, you know, Osmanlik has become much more popular and, and looked to in recent decades in Turkey. They don't want the Ottoman Empire either. They don't want a, a Shikul Islam, you know, they don't want a... Um, uh, they don't want the Uma. They don't want the religious leaders to be um, laying down the law, um, uh, you know, Sharia law for the whole country. I think they do want a more more respect uh, for the Turkish religious authorities or, or this, that, and the other thing. But um, I'm I'm not actually confident calling that view anti-modern. Um, I think they just want sort of respect for the religion. I think you can go too far to say, oh, the AK party is just the Republican party. They're conservative Christians. And no, absolutely, the AK party goes further than that. Um, but it's not, I wouldn't call it anti-modern in the way I think that you're, you're leaning towards. Um, Baku Babikar asks, what do you want the US government to change specifically in regards to its relationship to Saudi Arabia? Um, the U.S. government specifically, um, I did a video, I think it was uh, Who's More Dangerous, Iran or Saudi Arabia or something. It's one of the top videos. I can't remember the exact name. If you sort by most watched videos, you can find it. Um, and what I want is for the United States to treat Iran and Saudi Arabia similarly. I want, um, so at this point, we've got Iran down here, which is treated as a pariah state constantly um, threatened, constantly acted against violently. Um, I think the main thing keeping the Iranian theocracy in power is U.S. opposition at this point, actually. Um, so you've got that, you've got them down here, and then you've got Saudi Arabia, which is given absolutely everything it wants, is um, aided in its spreading of crazy Wahhabi ideas, is encouraged to invade Yemen. So what I want is I want Iran to sort of be brought up to like just treated like another country and I want Saudi Arabia to be brought down to just treated like another country. And I think the world would be a much better place if we, you know, I don't, I certainly don't want Saudi Arabia to be invaded. I am staunchly anti any kind of intervention. I don't even necessarily want like some diplomatic rupture or, or some, you know, you know, ending of the U.S. Saudi alliance. I just want them to be treated like a normal ally. I want them, you know, we, 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 and I want Iran to be treated the same way. You know, we, we, you know, generally at peace with these countries, not threatening these countries, um, but not endorsing their awful, awful policies and approaches as we do with Saudi Arabia. So, what I want is to just treat both Saudi Arabia and Iran as just normal countries that have serious human rights violations that we complain about um, and uh, um, and leave it at that. Um, and I think actually, you know, it's, it's interesting that if we adopted that policy, I think both Iran and Saudi Arabia would swiftly become much better countries. Um, though that's of course an arrogant, you know, uh, orientalist thing to say, but uh, I guess I'm an arrogant orientalist. Um, 
Okay. Logo Cool Extreme asks, will Kavanaugh repeal Roe v. Wade? Um, you know, I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't know. Who can say? The, the, the relationship of the Supreme Court to politics in the United States is very, very interesting. And I would expect... So what happens with the Supreme Court, it's not like they, you know, just decide, um, okay, we've got the right balance of conservatives. Roe v. Wade is done. What has to happen is a certain case has to come to the um, Supreme Court that deals with abortion, and then they can say, we're dealing, we're throwing out Roe v. Wade. But that's not generally how courts want to want to act, even if Kavanaugh and Roberts and Alito and Tom, well, I'm not sure if Thomas is, he's not generally seen as a uh, legal star, but, um, which is really unfortunate. Maybe a little racist. I don't know. Anyway, um, but uh, you know these conservative guys have all invade against Roe v. Wade and you know hate it and this that and the other thing. I think it might have been wrongly decided, but the Supreme Court, even though it claims not to be, is also a very political animal, and they will what they'll do if they get that abortion case, which they will. Um, there are always folks who are looking to send it up the chain and there's enough conservative judges now that that it, it will get to them they can make a decision once they get that with a given case how are we going to decide this are we going to take this abortion case and say roe v wade is officially overturned i think what's more likely is that they will get that case and they will judge it in a way that opens up more leeway for individual states to make decisions that limit abortion. But I would be surprised, given the way that precedent works, that they'd be willing to sort of sit there and on that five to four vote say, Roe v. Wade's done forever. Going forward, everybody should do whatever they want with abortion. And <laughs> fuck you, liberals. I would be surprised if they did that, because I think Roberts has already in a number of decisions, that's the chief justice, um, and one of those conservative votes has already shown that he's very um, cousin of the weird role that the Supreme Court occupies. Uh, FDR, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, sort of probably one of the most powerful presidents in U.S. history, tried to do court packing, which was basically to add, uh, I think the number of justices is not specified in the Constitution, so he um, tried to add more justices to get, his, um, to get his policies through. And he failed to do that, but what happened, what was very interesting, was having seen that, so the Supreme Court um, stopped blocking all of his programs because they're like, holy shit, like we almost lost our power completely. Like, so they got a lot more careful. And I think Roberts is already sort of conscious of that. Um, there's already a lot of people talking about how when the Democrats come back to power, they should do court packing. And the Supreme Court, the justices on the Supreme Court are, are you know, want to defend their power and want, you know, no matter how rabid a conservative or rabid a liberal as they are, they care about their power and they care about their institution. So I think Roberts, so yes, with the conservative majority on the court, I think abortion cases will start being uh, judged differently and will be judged in a way that gives states more opportunities to ban certain kinds of abortion. But I don't think, because these nine individuals have respect for precedent, have respect for things that have been said so far, because of the general sort of right of privacy that was um, established over a, a, over the 20th century and was sort of the core of the Roe v. Wade decision, I don't think that even the most conservative judges would be comfortable with just abandoning that completely. So will he overturn Roe v. Wade? I think that in practical applications, those conservative judges will be very interested in making rulings that that make that practically more possible, make abortion bans and abortion um limitations more possible but i think that those individual justices will be a lot will even the rapidly conservative ones will be very careful in how they do that so i don't think we're going to see like a okay oh roe wade wherever wade's gone and all that um what 50 years now of um almost 50 years of precedent goes out the window i think it'll be much more finely tuned and careful 
And I think a Planned Parenthood person would argue that practically that doesn't make any difference. Like it's still going to be restrictions on abortion or anything. And they might be right about that. But no, I don't think that Kavanaugh and the other conservative justices are going to outright repeal Roe v. Wade. Um, Cletus 223s, how accurate do you think that is? I'm not sure what you're talking about. Um, wow, Korai seems to be a big fan. Good for you. Um, what do you think of the Ib Lib Offensive? I think I covered that. Uh, Martin Pierre Fernand asks, what are you doing with that soda can? Um, I have a very terrible habit. I don't drink anymore. I don't smoke cigarettes anymore uh, since I left Turkey. I don't um, do not do Nargile anymore, which is good because I think my lungs are I'm actually having some trouble with them. But uh, I do still do a grizzly long cut uh, dip. It's a disgusting, disgusting habit. Um, but uh, I've, uh, after I finish this, I got to go on a 14 hour drive and nicotine helps me do it. Um, it's really gross. So yeah, it's a, it's a form of chewing tobacco. I keep it here. It's sort of like snooze for the Europeans, um, but it's grosser because you have to spit all the time. So that's that. Okay. Uh, Local Cool Extreme asks, uh, Japan says North Korea poses an urgent nuclear threat while South Korea is inc increasing its economic ties with the country. If North Korea were to go to berserk, its first target is Seoul. Why is Japan being a hawk? Man, um, I think that's a very difficult geopolitical question. Um, I think Korea has to deal, I think more respect should be given to Korea. I guess that's how I can say it. More respect should be given to South Korea's views on this because as you say, Seoul's the one that gets bombed. So South Korea is more interested and is always more interested in finding ways to deal with North Korea peacefully. And I think that that should obviously be respected and is obviously the better option. Japan is, you know, what, well, Japan is honestly, I mean, I've, I've read a number of books on Japan um, and I'm not too familiar with Abe and how he works, how his politics work. Um, Japan's in a really interesting position um, in terms of, uh, you know, they're sort of realizing that their US ally is not as reliable as it used to be. Um, I think possibly with Japan's belligerence on North Korea, they, they may be trying to back the US play, but with Trump, it's impossible to tell what the what the U.S. play actually is day to day. So I think Japan, um, yeah, I, I, I don't deal with North Korea. I've got a video saying why I never talk about North Korea because I don't actually think anything's going to change with that in the short term. Um, I think the North Korea issue will resolve or move to a different level very quickly and very unpredictably at some point within the next three weeks or 30 years. <laughs> Um, so it's, uh, and I think that's actually much more down to both politics between North and South Korea and the sort of black box that unknowable that is the North Korean regime. So I think that, you know, whether a U.S. president decides to be conciliatory or whether, whether a U.S. president chooses to be belligerent or whether the Chinese, you know, are less or more friendly to the North Korea regime. I, I, I just don't think any of that is as, is as important as what's going on in North and South Korea. Um, so I just don't cover the issue because I don't think, I mean, like I said, it could, everything could change tomorrow or it could be exactly the same for 30 years. And I just don't think the U.S. has too much to do with how that actually plays out. So I, I don't really focus on the North Korea issue much. Okay. Um. <laughs> uh, Shivan Sinatyal uh, uh, calls out. Uh, sorry if I. I'm sure. I'm sure. Sure, I mispronounced that. Um, called out an interesting. Uh, you know, being conservative doesn't mean racist. Today in India, LGBT got legal rights thanks to court and BJP right wing. Another example of how I just don't understand India. But, um, yeah, that was very exciting news to see. Um, it's, uh, I do think that the U.S. Um, and to a lesser extent Europe has too high expectations of sort of the global south in um, sort of instantly adopting um, pro-LGBT policies that, you know, we only adopted four or five years ago. Um, but I definitely am pro LGBT friendly policies and uh, very happy to see that India made that choice. 
um, and uh, that's fantastic. Um, so yeah, um, okay, okay. <laughs> Stop with the can, please. Sorry. Um, okay. Um, the Sunny three 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 asks, "What do you think about the fate of France?" What do I think about the fate of France? Um, I'm cautiously optimistic about Macron, whose name I can never pronounce. Macron, Macron. Um, I think that for a very long time, people have known what needed to happen in France, and everybody from the socialists to, gosh, the Sarkozy's part, I think Republicans or whatever, like all the classic center left and center right parties failed miserably to do it. And I think uh, tremendously exciting what Macron managed to pull off electorally. And my understanding is he's, he's been able to do um, uh, some labor market reforms. I can't speak to the detail of how effective those have been, but that has been what France has needed for quite some time. And it's exciting to see some movement there. Uh, you know, I know a lot of people don't like Macron because he's a neoliberal. Well, I'm a neoliberal. Um, I, as I talked in, talked about in that, um, what is neoliberalism video just um, a week or so back, um, I talked about um, uh, how I think some countries need more uh, Anglo-Saxon economics or neoliberalism or, or what have you, and France would definitely be one of those countries. So I think having Macron in there is great. Um, I'd also point you to the video, um, I think uh, the European Union is running out of time. I think what Macron's up to is very, very important because if he fails, um, I think that um, that Le Pen uh, Front National vote that has gone up in every election for the past five years, uh, you know, could uh, go up more and actually end up with that very troubling party having real power in uh, France. And if they do, I think that might be the end of the European project, um, which would make me very, very sad. Um, so I'm tremendously hopeful uh, for France, um, but also tremendously worried. So there you are. Uh, uh, okay. Hossein Hodrog asks, can you do a video about France future and Europe in general? I really should actually, um, you know, what's happening in Italy, but there's a lot of moving parts to that. Um, I think I've got some great Europe videos, actually. Um, but as far as like speaking to the detail of European politics uh, right now, um, I wouldn't be able to read books, but I would have to read a lot of sort of long reports. Um, and I just don't have the bandwidth to do that right now. I'm trying to finish this book and um, trying to figure out this video on Venezuela um, and trying to do, you know, worthwhile weekly video production and write a book. So what I would need to do, I think your instinct is absolutely right. I need to do a video about France future and Europe in general. Um, I think I've got some really good coverage of Europe and I'd like to do more. I really need to deal with Brexit. I've got a Northern Ireland video percolating, but once again, I got to do the reading on that before I can put it out. So yeah, a lot of stuff to do. Um, Logo Cool Extreme asks, was the American Revolution a war for the wealthy to stop paying taxes or liberty for the average American? Uh, the answer to that is both. Um, uh, there's a dual revolution thesis or something. And we're going back to AP US history in high school here. But um, yeah, it was, it was both of those things. Uh, I think the success of the US Revolution, I think in, in ways that um, um, a lot of revolutions aren't successful. Uh, the French, I'm thinking of specifically, you know, the classic, you know, is the French Revolution over yet? Um, I think the fact that the U.S. Revolution was elite-driven and, yes, largely carried out for uh, elite, in the name of elite priorities, might have had something to do with how successful it was, um, which is not a very uh, democratic or forward-thinking way of looking at it. But I think what it did was it provided the venue for for incremental changes, um, sort of civil rights, LGBT, you know, sort of everything. Um, so I'm a big fan of the U.S. Revolution, but I think uh, 
the suspicion that it might have been more elite driven and for elite priorities than um, most revolutions we talk about is probably accurate. So. Um, okay. Oh, that's very interesting. Uh, Evan James Inglis says, please give Ukraine a chance. The false dichotomy between NATO and Russia is harmful to their current struggle to fight corruption and redirect their economy westwards. Civic engagement is on the rise. I would love to be optimistic about Ukraine. I've visited Ukraine twice uh, over the past two years and loved it, um, you know, with the exception of the absolutely rampant and disgusting anti-Semitism. Uh, I went to... Lvov, and there was a moving and, 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 and sad monument to a, to a synagogue that had been destroyed by the Nazis. And next to it, there was a store and a restaurant selling anti-Semitic tchotchkes. Um, but I think it's probably very small-minded of me to focus on that rather than the very real struggles that Ukraine is going through. Um, I think I'm guilty of selling Ukraine short because I do believe that the sort of um, the revolution or coup um, that happened in 2014 was U.S. motivated to a degree that was uh, both unfortunate and uh, deeply problematic. Um, but that doesn't mean that the Ukrainian people don't have real potential, real issues, and uh, I really hope they work through it and, and are successful at it. Uh, it's an incredible country with incredible potential that just keeps not getting it. And uh, I hope that civic engagement is on the rise. I hope that corruption is on the way to being defeated. Um, uh, I haven't done the detailed uh, reading on Ukraine, but it's a beautiful country. It's an amazing place. I would uh, recommend highly visiting Ukraine, Kiev and Lvov, probably two of my favorite places to visit over the past couple of years. Um, so yeah. Bilal Keskin asks, what do you think about the U.S.-Turkey relationship? Well, um, I've got a lot of videos on that. Um, you know, the most recently, uh, did Trump kill the Turkish economy? Um, if you sort by most watched videos, I've got why is the Turkey's relationship with the West falling apart? Um, I think that's all, as you'll see if you watch the videos, I think that's deeply entwined with the Syria debacle, uh, you know, both in Turkey's uh, uh, internal politics and in their external relationships with U.S. and Turkey. I'd also recommend why is Turkey such a mess, which I made, like, gosh, two, two, three years ago, um, which includes a very incorrect prediction about Brazil. Um, another what happens when I don't do the research um, thing. Uh, but I think it's also a really valuable video because it points out the ways that um, uh Turkey's relationships with the U.S. and Europe uh, had a lot to do with Syria and also ended up giving Erdogan more power than he would have had otherwise. So, yeah, um, I don't think I need to go in too much degree. Um, Argad Argad says, Robert, you speak that if the EU dissolved, chances of war will increase in Europe, but aren't you forgetting there are nukes involved, and hence the Europeans will be careful in waging war. There are nukes involved between Russia and France and the UK. Um, but I don't think, I don't see potential conflict um, in Europe between the, the great powers. I think if things went really, really wrong for a number of decades, like 50 to 100 years, then maybe France and Germany and the UK could fall out again and there'd be some kind of conflict between them. But I don't see that. What I do see are things happening in Eastern Europe. None of those powers are nuclear powers. Um, I think without the EU, the Balkans would very quickly fall to shit. Um, and then, of course, that means that not just Russia and, you know, um, Germany, France would take a bigger hand in the Balkans. It means that, I don't know, why not Hungary? I mean, Hungary used to own big chunks of the Balkans, and their politics right now are very oriented towards we've been done wrong, you know, after the world wars and this, that, and the other thing. Um what does it mean there's a conflict between Hungary and Romania over um, you know, chunks of land and populations? There's potential conflicts between Poland and Ukraine. There's a lot of history in there um, that involves a lot of countries that don't have nukes. And I think while I have a lot of critiques of the EU, I think a lot of the critiques of the EU are very valid, democratic deficit. I think the euro was 
a catastrophe. I, you know, there, I meant to read. There's some reevaluations of that recently, saying that actually maybe the euro wasn't such a bad thing. But man, um, Europe would not have been in this much of a mess if it wasn't for the euro currency. So, um, so yeah, there's a lot of non-nuclear powers with a lot of historical grievances and a lot of sort of right-wing political parties that want to talk about those political grievances coming to power, and the EU is acting both through structural funds, you know, sort of outright bribes to get them to behave in a certain way and, you know, moral leadership or whatever. Um, the EU is keeping a lid on a lot of those things. Um, the main thing, keeping the Balkans, sort of Croatia, Serbia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Montenegro, Macedonia, Kosovo, um, I'm probably forgetting one of them. The main thing that's keeping all those countries from sort of falling back into the mess they were in in the early 90s, you know, violence, slaughter, ethnic cleansing, genocide, um, the main thing keeping that from becoming the, the, the seat of European conflict that it always was, that's what started World War I, the main thing that's keeping that from setting off again is the prospect of joining the EU. Um, and, and when the EU has gone, yeah, everyone's like, oh, well, what about NATO? I mean, NATO is a fucking arms sales um, racket. Um, I, I now support the continued existence of NATO because NATO succeeded in turning Russia into a rogue state, and now we need it for another 25 years. But that's not the reason why sort of peace and prosperity has spread through Eastern Europe over the past 20 years. It's because of the EU, because of the European Union. Um, and when that goes away, Eastern Europe becomes, a, once again, becomes a much more, much darker and more unpredictable place. So, yeah. Um, Amar Jamakovic asks, have you thought about doing a podcast with Caspian Report? Man, I would love to do a podcast with Caspian Report. I love Caspian Report. Caspian Report is freaking awesome. Um I did, I think, try to reach out to Sh Shervan. Um, at a pro I'm probably mispronouncing that. I think I reached out to Shervan, you know, a number of years back and was ignored um, because at that point I probably had about, you know, a thousand subscribers and was regularly getting 300 uh, views. Um, now that I, you know, I'm occasionally getting one to two to, to 50 to 700,000 views, I should uh, I should probably reach out to him again. He might be more interested in, in uh, hearing from me. Um, that's a great suggestion. I would love to. Uh, Caspian Report is fantastic. Uh, if you are not a follower of Caspian Report uh, on YouTube, you should be. Um, he, I think, is much more careful and does much more in-depth coverage of individual conflicts, uh, probably makes better videos than I do. Um, I think uh, I have more firmly held opinions, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, that, that's I'm incorrect. He's much more objective than I am um, and uh, produces excellent content. If I'm ever um, researching a topic, one of my first stops is what his Caspian Report said about this. Um, I don't always agree with him. I'm, I often disagree. Um, but. Um, uh, but he does excellent work, and you should absolutely follow Caspian Report if you care about the issues that this channel covers. And I would love to love to work with him. I should I should reach out to him again uh, because I am I am a slightly more um, serious entity than I was a year ago. So, um, Mustafa Tanirit Tanir asks, "What do you think about George Friedman and his future predictions?" I think George Friedman is. Uh, he's the Strat4 guy. I believe that's his organization. Um, and I like what he does. I like that he just sort of gets, and I, I think aim to do a bit of that myself. He just sort of gets out there, makes counterintuitive predictions. Um, but I think, he, you know, so if you've got Caspian Report, he's very objective, trying to talk about what's going on here. I think if you've got me, who's like a little more opinionated and trying to tease out very real dynamics that people are missing, um, and, you know, occasionally screws up. I think George Friedman is like kind of like, you know, it's kind of fantasy in a lot of ways. I mean, and he, it's we need that kind of thinking. It's great sort of like, you know, big picture, you know, what is military? You know, what's military? What are wars going to look like 50 years from now? What are um, he's got much more resources than I do or Caspian Report does. And and I think it I think he provides valuable, you know, gee, what's going to happen? Um, but his value as, you know, predicting things and like the value of his intelligence networks that he talks about and whatnot, I think is pretty, pretty debatable. 
but I've definitely enjoyed uh, some of his books. And uh, it's, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's much further towards science fiction uh, sometimes, but, um, but I am a huge consumer of science fiction. And I think science fiction has a lot of insights that are useful. Um, you know, I'm seeing this on, on the, on the strength of, I think I've read two of his books, like the next hundred years or something like that. And it's been three or four years. I can't speak to the work of Stratfor more generally or, um, or his, you know, sort of general thing, but I've been kind of, uh, I think it, it's, it's valuable work that he does, but I'd say I've been more amused than impressed, I guess, um, with, with his main books. Um, not to say that, I mean, uh, I think uh, his, it's been a while since I read them, but I, I, I recall enjoying them very much and also that uh, they prompted thinking. And I think that's the most important thing that any, any of us could do. Um, but I see him as a little less serious, certainly than Caspian Report, and a little less serious than I am, frankly. Um, so, I'll, you know, maybe a lot less serious than I and Caspian Report are. So, so there's that. Um, but still, really interesting stuff. Um, um, okay. Are Israel, Japan, South Korea, and the UK American colonies like Saudi Arabia? That's an interesting question. You know, I, as this Avoiding British Empire um, book makes clear, is I think that for the past 200, since 1815, really. Um, so yeah, for the past 203 years, the entire world has been functioning within the context of worldwide systems led by one country. Yes, of course, the Soviet Union, you know, uh, existed. Um, I think the Soviet Union was absolutely a real threat to U.S. hegemony up until, say, the 1960s or so. After that, not so much. Um, so when I think of um, you know, Israel, might you know, I go back and forth on that, but, you know, is certainly further down the spectrum towards Saudi Arabia than Japan, South Korea, and the U.K. are. But the term that I use that's a little insulting, but I think actually kind of gets at the truth of it with Japan, uh, South Korea, and certainly the United Kingdom. Uh, the United Kingdom is, if, if, if the bottom is sort of dependence and, and uh, obedience to the United States, you've got sort of Saudi Arabia on the floor somewhere. You've got, you know, Israel, um, you know, maybe at the table, you've got UK right here, and then Japan, South Korea, other European countries a little further up. Um, but the term I would use generally, um, sort of as we get to the table and above, would be vassal states. Um, I think that's very, you know, sort of the concept from feudalism. Um, they um, uh, sort of owe a certain, they are independent, they have their own powers, they can make their own choices, but they also owe a really high degree of sort of homage uh, to um, the United States that is not fully appreciated. Um, and I think that plays out in domestic politics, foreign politics, um, in ways that aren't fully appreciated. And I think a lot of that with Japan, South Korea, the EU, uh, UK specifically, has to do with those uh, sort of weird financial empire aspects that I was talking about earlier, those just really detailed commercial relations that um, are nowhere near as fully understood as they should be. Um, so yeah, vassal countries is what I would use. But no, they're not as, um, Saudi Arabia would not exist without the United States. Um, well, to be clear, Saudi Arabia was created by the British Empire um, to sort of fight against Pan-Arabism and keep the Middle East unstable and easy to control and has been maintained in that way by the United States. Um, I think Israel's, the support for Israel, as I said in this week's video, um, I think has a lot to do with similar dynamics, but I think Israel has more, certainly has more independent reason to exist um, and power than Saudi Arabia does. And um, the other countries you mentioned are all, you know, much more, are serious, independent, viable states um, that, uh, no question, but I see their current sort of, um, set up as sort of vassal states, which is a little insulting, but I think kind of describes what's going on. Okay. Mm. Jano 26186, in the 90s, there were countries that wanted to make EU a federation. Do you think that would be a better alternative? 
Uh, that gets, man, you know, it's, uh, you know, I don't want to put on a lawyer hat, but that gets into, um, you know, complexity that I'm certainly don't have at my fingertips right now. Um, do I think that the EU needs a different approach, uh, way to handle things? Absolutely. Uh, can I say, speak specifically to what a federation would mean? No, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd have to, I, I, the EU is another thing I'd love to do a deep dive on, but there are only so many hours in the day. Um, the Sunny 3333 asks, what's your opinion about the refugees crisis? Um, I think on the top homepage, uh, I think that the refugee crisis was created by really fucking stupid policies by the U.S. government, specifically in Libya and Syria. Um yeah, I, I, the knee-jerk reaction is, oh, they're not all from Syria and Libya. No, but it was the destruction of Libya and Syria by the U.S. government that opened up those pathways of transit and created the crisis, the refugee crisis that may destroy the European Union. And I think that was just such a cataclysmically stupid thing to do. Um, I think that uh, Sweden and Germany um, actually were very smart to take in large numbers of immigrants. Um, I think that's going to help both of their economic models in the long term. Uh, Sweden's looking a little more shaky now. Uh, the Sweden Democrats come to power in the election, I think, in the coming weeks. You know, who knows? Some of those people might even get sent home, which I think would be pretty horrific. But I'm more sympathetic, so you, you, you might be getting the sense that I have sort of an SGW, uh, SJW pro-refugee um, bias, and I absolutely do, but I'm very conscious of the fact that it was the United States that created this problem, and it is fucking horrific that we have taken in, you know, now under Trump, we're taking in essentially no refugees. Most of the Syrian conflict, I think up until the last years of Obama, we were taking in almost no refugees. Um, I think the sort of standard baseline was that the U.S. would take 70,000 refugees a year or something like that, and it never went higher than that. Um, and that meant taking refugees from everywhere. Um, and uh, I think it is shameful that the United States can, can try to tell Europe that it should be taking more people while uh, we're taking nobody from these countries that we destroyed. Um, and yes, they're not just from Syria and Libya, but the, the, this dynamic that was created because we destroyed those countries. Um, and I'm, um, it's interesting. I, I, I sort of tend to look at countries differently in terms of what they're, you know, the former great powers and, and countries that, that still have aspirations to be great powers uh, in Western Europe. Um, I'm much less sympathetic to them um, and their sort of anti-refugee bent. Um, I think the United Kingdom, um, you know, they essentially created the world system that we have today. And uh, when, when that creates victims, they should take them in, um, as should the United States. Um, and once again, I'm angriest at the United States for its refugee policies by far than I am at any European country. But uh, Western European countries, I think, like France or, or the UK, and I think to an extent Germany, just because of the amount of power that it has and the you know, leading role that it took in sort of destroying the British world system, um, uh, you know, should, should take in refugees. And I'm very pleased and impressed uh, with Germany and Angela Merkel for doing that and Sweden as well. Um, I do think Sweden went a little too far and are, are now pushing their politics over to um, a direction that is unfortunate, um, and that's a problem. Uh, Eastern European countries, I find it really distasteful the way that they treat refugees and their anger, but I look at the countries of Eastern Europe and they're not the people who built this world system. They're not the people who um, uh, benefited from it. Um, you know, they're really only recently liberated countries themselves. Um, so while I don't like how anti-refugee Orban or the Polish government is, I understand it, and um, I'm a big fan of sovereignty. And uh, I, I um, think that if the Eastern European countries don't want to take refugees, I think that is their right. Um, I think legally that might not be true. And yeah, I think those laws might need to be changed. Um, so yeah, I have differing degrees of sympathy, but I am generally a pro-refugee, sort of pro-immigration, uh, pro-even economic migrant, uh, SJW type. But I am conscious that, yeah, th there's a limit. Um, and I think that because of US government actions, Europe has been forced beyond that limit. 
um, and that's a real tragedy. Um, and while I definitely believe in encouraging Europe to take more refugees and be more generous, I am very conscious that as a US citizen, that's a fucked up thing for me to be arguing for because it's our fault. So that's what I think about the refugee question. Okay. Um, Okay, you said in the video that Turkey failed to show Pastor's connection to Coop, but there are tons of pictures which show Pastor with PKK militants and our phone calls between Pastor and Gulen call. Are there? Because I haven't seen that. I'll, you know, I'll look into that again. Um, I've seen a lot of bullshit about him being involved with Iraqi gold and some pictures of that and pictures that it's clearly not him. Um, yeah, the definition of PKK militant is pretty broad in the Turkish uh, uh, sort of government circles right now. Uh, did he try to proselytize to some Kurds? He's a religious missionary. Um, you know, he talks to a lot of people. Uh, phone calls between Pastor and the Gulen cult. Yeah, well, that's kind of ridiculous because up until 2012, the Gulenists were a main prop and enforcer of Erdogan's government. You know, they're the people who were sort of um, the, 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 the front line of Erdogan's takeover of the Turkish government. So yeah, um, of course, um, he would have had to have dealt with Gulen people um, up in, you know, at some point in his 23 year old, 23 year history in um, Turkey, because up until 2012, Gulen's people were AK Party people, were Erdogan's people. So yeah, um, I'm, I'm under impressed. But that said, I mean, in the comment to this video, leave me some links and maybe I'm wrong. Um, but yeah, I, I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, uh, um, Bullshit, for lack of a better word, about um, the way that the Turkish government treats this Gulen movement that up until five years ago was the Turkish government. Um, that's a broad statement, but I think it's fair. Um, so, uh, Amar Jamakovic asks, what do you think about the ideas of fragmentation and balkanization of the United States across racial and political lines considering the demographic structure? I think it's bullshit, put, put simply. Um, there's a video I think I made about a year ago, like... Um, Something, if you search sort of civil war, like uh, is there a civil war coming in the United States or something like that? And I talk about how um, compared to other periods in US history, um, the US is nowhere near as divided as it used to be. Um, I've got a video I've been having difficulty with um, that I've been trying to write just about this sort of concept of Latino and sort of how fraught and kind of ridiculous it is. It's the second most uh, ridiculous and manufactured identity in the United States after white people. Um, and uh, I think the, the most important, I mean, uh, yeah, uh, no, I think the idea of sort of fractious, I think that's, that's horse shit and is um, uh, sort of the reaction of certain poor whites who um, I think, you know, have been sort of shut out of the benefits of the U.S. economy over the past 20 years. People who don't have much power and make a lot of noise and are just, you know, silly and dying off, which is not good, which is not good. Um, but uh, I think um, that kind of ideology and thinking is a reaction to sort of continued U.S. progress towards social justice, for lack of a better word. And um, it's always been there. Um, it's, uh, it's a little more obvious because folks can have YouTube channels now. Um, but uh, I mean, you look at the history of the Ku Klux Klan, the John Birch Society, the Know Nothings. I mean, this is a stream of thought that's always been uh, available in the United States and has always been wrong. What the United States does have, this is oversold, but I do think it's true. Um, what the United States does have that Europe doesn't is we have a sort of civic religion or public culture that's based on the constitution and not based on a particular race or or ethnicity or, or what have you. And over and over and over again, you see a group like the Know Nothings or the Ku Klux Klan or the alt-right try to set some kind of boundary or definition of what is and isn't, you know, white or American or appropriate or good or bad or what have you. And they always fail. And what's, what's fascinating is um, with alt-right characters, like the number of them, or even sort of softer right characters like Janine Pirro or Sean Hannity on Fox News, these people who 
you know, by earlier, by their sort of ideological forebears would not be seen as white or American, sort of Irish or Italian folks, you know, um, that are as, you know, that are, you know, Irish and Italian folks that are sort of mainstream white American indisputably today, you know, 50 years ago or 100 years ago, you know, Catholics uh, were, were, were seen as, you know, a terrible threat that we're going to bring religious and race war to the United States. And I think it's all bullshit. Um, I'm quite confident we're doing just fine. Just on Latinos specifically, um, this will hopefully be in a video in the next couple months, but uh, it's just uh, um, 10 years ago, 45% of Latinos um, spoke Spanish at home. Um, 10 years later, and I think it was the census figures I'm talking about. Um, I should probably nail that down as I've been talking about this figure a lot. It's fallen from 45% to 35% in just 10 years. Assimilation actually works much more quickly than it used to. Um, I've been reading for years. There's this guy, Victor Davis Hanson, who's a, apparently a very decent uh, classical um, historian who's made a big thing talking about Mexifornia and the way that these Latinos are taking over California and destroying it. And I spent six months in Southern California um, in, um, uh, in uh, last year, um, sort of San Diego, Los Angeles, um, San Francisco. Um, and man, uh, I saw none of what he's talking about. <laughs> Um, it's, uh, it's just, it's, it's fascinating how quickly sort of assimilation is working. And also the whole, I think a lot of that kind of talk is focused on Latinos specifically, the hordes coming from South America and they're not coming anymore. I've got a number of videos on that. I think most recent is why Donald Trump's wall is stupid. Oh, and I've also got U.S. immigration is U.S. power. Um, some of the oldest videos, you know, what the Republicans don't want you to know about immigration. This whole idea of a border crisis, this whole idea that, you know, Latinos are taking over, they're going to take back California is ludicrous horseshit. Um, so, yeah, I think I can answer that. Hmm. What's your view of Eric Schneiderman and Andrew Cuomo as New York Attorney General? I think Eric Schneiderman was the New York Attorney General who recently, um, who was supposed to be a big Trump resistance hero, but recently lost his job because of some kind of, I don't even know, I don't care. Andrew Cuomo is the governor, who's currently facing a sort of progressive insurgency from Cynthia Nixon, a star of Sex and the City. Um, I don't have really um, firmly held um, views on New York politics. It's not something I've really looked into in great detail. Um, I'm more interested in sort of like the fading power of New York, New York State, New York City um, in U.S. politics. Um, I did a video, The Fall of New York. It was kind of interesting. Yeah, I don't have anything specific to say on Schneiderman or Cuomo. Um, I think the New York Attorney General's office is very interesting in sort of the ongoing Trump scandals. I um, did a video on the Mueller investigation where I kind of poo-pooed it. I don't expect much to come out of it. I think that um, uh, Trump's um, fall, if it comes about for legal reasons, most likely will be coming out of the New York Attorney General's office. So that's significant. But um, Amara Jamakovic says there are millions of Hispanics demanding Aslan, and they're the main champions of that idea. I think that uh, the Reconquista, they call it. Well, the numbers aren't there, um, and that's fading away. Another big hate. Um, I don't know if this goes a little too detailed. Um, um, how to deal with this. Um, okay, so another one of the big hate organizations is uh, the admittedly, I think, very poorly um, named uh, Latino lobby group called the National Council of La Raza, uh, which if you translate it is the race. And I think that's, it's pretty gross, actually, when you think about it, and I agree. Um, but I actually, uh, in my work in Washington, D.C., I got to know some people at NCLR and like the kind of work they do. Um, yeah, I don't want to go into any sort of biographical details, but I got to know some of the leaders, some people in leadership positions in NCLR. And man, like, it's a fantasy. <laughs> like, these folks are, you know, just another interest group for a, for a, um, uh, you know, for a group and, you know, interested in sort of incremental 
minutia of, of uh, claims, you know, probably a bigger defender of affirmative action for Latinos than I would be or whatnot, but it, it's just very much a sort of normalized political group seeking political goals that, you know, certainly um, are, you know, a little too identity politics focused, as is Donald fucking Trump. Um, but uh, yeah, the idea that there's some sinister plot that has any real potential is a joke, mostly for the demographic reasons that I've laid out in my videos that, you know, the Mexicans aren't coming anymore. The Central Americans are barely coming anymore. Um, it's it's uh, it's and the folks that are here are assimilating very quickly. It's uh, this Aztlan. I mean, it's great for scaring old white people, but it's horseshit. Um, I know. I'm sorry. I, yeah. Wow. Someone says, "Why wow, you're still alive?" And I actually have to drive 14 hours, so I should probably um, call an end to it. Um, but uh, this is great. Um, NB says, countries are created by higher powers, keeping them divided in continuous war as a way of human sacrifice, question mark, question mark, question mark. That's an interesting approach. Um, they haven't been very good at it over the past 70 years because sort of violence and death and war has been fading. It's almost dying out. Um, but yeah, I mean, quite potential. We could be building up pressures for World War III. I talk about that a bit. But uh, no, NB, I don't think uh, it's a creation of higher powers for, for human sacrifice. Um, I think I already dealt with Eric Schneiderman, Andrew Cuomo. Um, Amara Jamakovic says, I hope so. The end of Pax Americana would be one of the greatest tragedies in human history. Wow. Thank you. I kind of agree with that, actually. Um, I'm a big fan of Pax Americana, uh, even with all of its nastiness. Um, as I hope to get into in great detail in my book, Avoiding the British Empire, which needs to get done. Okay, uh, yeah, I have been doing this for two and a half hours, which is kind of ridiculous. And I've got things to do, um, places to be. Uh, and uh, thank you guys all so much for participating and being a part of this. Um, and, um, man, great Venezuela question, but yeah, I've been doing this too long. Logo Cool Extreme, I'm sorry. I'm fading and I got things to do. Um, so thank you all for participating. My name is Rob Morris. Uh, I am more or less the More Freedom Foundation, or at least it's only employee. All of you guys are the More Freedom Foundation. Um, if you'd like to uh, contribute, uh, there is a PayPal link that I should put in the description. Um, you can click on the Patreon link. You can find all these links at the center on the sort of front page of YouTube. Um, uh, there's the ongoing crowdfunding thing on Patreon. That'd be very grateful if you consider chipping into. Um, uh, I'm on Instagram at the Golden Age. I'm on Twitter at Robo Law. Uh, please subscribe if you haven't already. I'd imagine that most people who are here are subscribers. And uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, I hope this wasn't too self-indulgent. It seems like folks were willing to participate and watch. Um, but I think it's useful to sort of have a video that... Uh, puts out uh, who I am, what I'm about, and what this MFF thing is about, uh, to a degree anyway. Uh, so thank you so much. I'm incredibly grateful. You guys are the best. And um, many thanks. <laughs>